All right, we are going to do the, the big document today. This is the uh, AIA A201. Um, as you guys probably saw, there are a ton of slides for this. I have every provision in the contract, so some will blow through really quickly that are irrelevant, but I um, just want to highlight them. Others I'll tell you which are the more important ones. We will get through today through the end of Article 5. Now, there are 15 articles in the documents. So you're like, how do we get through only five today and 10 next week? A lot of stuff in the back end of the document goes pretty quickly. So we will get all of them in in the next two sessions, um, but they will be the full sessions um, these next couple of days. If you remember, we did the B101 first, the AIA documents. Um, the A series is owner contractor side. The B series is owner architect side. On the A series, there's an A, a series of A100 documents, 101, 102, 103, 104, and, and so forth. That part works in conjunction with this document. So you cannot have a contract between an owner and a contractor with simply the A201. There'll be a 100 series front end. This is the back end of the general terms and conditions. What the 100 series is, whether it's a 101, 102, 103, or 104, is structurally it's used as the terms of the business deal. It's going to have the price of the project that the contractor is going to get paid. It's going to have the schedule, and it will have information on how they're going to be paid. Sometimes it's going to be, I'll do it for a lump sum. We'll build this factory for you for $10 million. Another part, that's the A101. The A102 will say, I'll do it for cost of the work, exactly what I cost, what it costs me, the contractor, plus my fee, that'll be a percentage, with a cap, a guaranteed maximum price. So that's called a GMP agreement or guaranteed maximum price agreement. That's the 102. The 103 is the cost plus with no cap, so it's open-ended. And depending on what type of project you're in and what you want to negotiate and what the risks that exist will dictate whether you're going to use lump sum, GMP, cost plus, or some of the other models that exist. But all of those 100 series documents will use this document as the back end. What this document, and we'll go through today, is, and I've used this term or this kind of analogy in the past, this, the information in this document are the rules to play Monopoly. It's how and what everybody's duties and obligations are. So there's going to be, we're going to go through the sections, section on contractor obligations, section on owner obligations, section on subcontractor obligations, and it will define what the parties will actually be doing with respect to the project. It refers back occasionally to the A101 or the 102 or the 100 series. It also sometimes refers to the architect agreements. And so, as we all know, the AIA documents work together as a suite. So you have, when you're in a contract with the owner architect, they're going to be in the B101, 102, 103, whatever it is. And that document refers to the A201 and vice versa. So they all kind of work collaboratively. The other thing you got to remember is, um, as I told you when we were going through the, one, the B101, if you see a term where the, 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 the term is capitalized, the first letter is capitalized, like substantial completion or contract documents or something to that effect, that term has a defined term. That's a rule of contract drafting. Any term that has capitalized is defined. So somewhere in this document, there will be a specific definition that says substantial completion means the following. And it's relevant for Later, when you have to figure out who owes whom what obligations, you go back and look at some of the capitalized terms and what they're relevant for, and then that may play out if there's litigation or other disputes on trying to say, well, who, what does this really mean? They are called terms of art. They have legal meaning, and they're relevant and very important to me, and obviously, ultimately, they need to be important to you guys. So, that's kind of the little background, and from here, we'll just start rolling through the provisions. So, Article 1, general provision, pretty simple. What we're going to talk about here, the contract documents. Here, contract documents, right out of the box. It's a defined term, and here is what list is the contract documents. Um, in, in the slides, you're going to see various, like we did with the B101, various sections that are going to be highlighted in bold. Those are my ads. Those are not highlighted in bold in the original document. Those are something that I added that I think is the, probably the more important relevant position or piece of language in, in the provision. So, it's going to talk about, um, here there's going to be, it's going to have drawings, specifications, addenda, 
And then, then there's going to be this kind of order of what is the most important. We have order one, we have a written amendment to the contract, is signed by both parties. Number two, a change order. Three, constructive change directives. These are how you modify the contract and make them take precedent. Because we have a contract, when we're done with negotiating the contract between the owner and the architect, we have the four corners of the agreement. But as the project progresses along, there may be change orders. You find out, well, the soils aren't exactly what I thought. Or the owner wants to add another bathroom. Whatever the change that happens comes after you've signed this contract. And so you have to issue a change order. That may change schedule, it may change price, it may change scope, it may change any combination of the three. That then becomes priority on top of what's in here because it came after the fact. And so, unless specifically enumerated by the, in the agreement, the contract documents and highlighted do not include the advertisement for invitation to bid. So when you go out to bid, remember the designer is going to do the designs and then their requirements of the B101 after they finish the contract documents, it'll go out to bid. Any information in that bid, that RFP, that request for proposals or invitation to bid, specifically says it is not a contract document. Okay? Including forms or other information furnished by the owner in anticipation of receiving this. That's an important thing for a contractor because sometimes what happens in a project is they get the RFP and it's got some information in it and they submit a bid. I will bid build your house for $2 million based on the RFP you gave me. And here's what I'm going to do. I, I looked at your sample contract and here are some of my changes and modifications. The owner looks at the three or four or five contractors that are bidding it. They select one of them because they have the best price and the best reputation and the best team or whatever the reason is that they select that contractor. And then the contractor and the owner enter into negotiations for what the contract will really look like. Owner said, here's my first shot at it. Contractor's going to have their pushbacks. And so what this provision says is, Whatever your first shot, whatever was in that RFP, doesn't count. It's the final document, and that's the final document here. So it's just a rules to the road that's protective of the contractor, but everybody gets on the same page, so to speak. Continuing on, the contract documents form the contract for construction. So when you just see the word contract, you're going to know that it includes everything encompassing. Okay? And it's an entire and integrated agreement between the party. And it supersedes prior negotiations. So what I was just talking about, that back and forth, owner sends out the RFP with the contract, here's what I want you to do. Contractor says, okay, I can build your house for $2 million. I want to change some of the things in your contract. I don't agree with all your provisions. There's going to be a back and forth negotiation, and you get to the final document. This specifically says it's going to supersede any prior negotiation. What's on this final document is the final. Okay? The contract document shall not be construed to treat a con create a contractual relationship of any kind between the contractor and the architect. So we go back to that triangle I always talked about. Owner on top, solid line to contractor. Owner, solid line to architect. There's only a dotted line between, on the bottom of the two corner pieces, contractor and architect. There is no contract. The line is dotted because they communicate, but there are no legal obligations. This backs this up. It says it does not create a contract between contractor and architect. It also doesn't create a contract between the owner and any subcontractor. If we look at it, the owner has the triangle, the owner has the direct line to the contractor, and the subcontractors all fit under the contractor's umbrella. But the owner doesn't have any direct contract with the subcontractor. And that's relevant as far as the owner can't tell the subcontractor to, what to do. They can only tell the contractor what to do, and then the contractor takes it downstream. That's protection for the contractor. If you think about it, if I'm a contractor and I bid a project out and I get all my trades lined up to build the project and then the owner starts telling my trades what to do and maybe my trades want to go work for the contract for the owner directly, the owner can steal my business away. I've done all the hard work of gathering people together and if the owner can start directing traffic for people down below me, that's detrimental to the contractor's business. It also is beneficial to the owner. Most owners don't want to deal with 15 or 20 or 30 trades. Most owners want to deal with just one entity. So it's a single purpose. I only have to tell the contractor what to do. You take care of your people below you. So this specifically says, doesn't create one between the owner and the subs, nor between the owner and the architect or the architect's consultants. 
and it doesn't create between persons or other entities other than the owner and the contractor. This agreement specifically says owner, contractor. That's it. Now, one of the questions is when I read this provision, you're like, why do we put that in there? I mean, it's just signed by the owner and the contractor. Well, why do you do that? Well, because there has been, and as I talked about in the past, the AIA documents are updated every 10 years. They're living, breathing documents. And many of the provisions that are in there now came up because of consistent litigation in the past. And what will happen is when they update these in 2027, they'll look at the problems or the pieces of litigation that came up subject to this document over a 10-year period, and they say, we need to fix this, we need to tweak this, let's change the language. So, obviously, sometime in the past, the owners were trying to direct traffic and trying to tell subcontractors what to do, or architects and contractors were going in, so they needed to add language to clarify this. This is an agreement between owner and contractor only, and nobody else. Okay? The work. Another defined term. It's the construction and services required for the contract documents, includes all labor materials, equipment, and services provided or to be provided by the contractor to fulfill the contractor's obligations. Okay? It does not, the work does not include the architectural services. And if you remember, we did the cost of the work. Remember we were trying to figure out there was a term in um, the AIA, the B101 in Article 6, I think it's 6.3, that defines what the cost of the work is. And so when the owner's putting together its budget, I have $2 million to spend on this project. That doesn't mean that they can spend $2 million on construction if that's the overall budget because they need to pay their architect and other things which are outside of the cost of the work. So this is a, a kind of an affirmation of what we saw in the B101. The work is simply the labor, materials, equipment, and services provided by the contractor. Okay? The project is the total construction of which the work is performed under the contract documents. So everything. Sometimes the work and the project can be different. Think of the project as the largest umbrella possible and the work is what's actually going on. Because you talk about the architect is working on the project, but we know that the architect isn't doing the work. The drawings. Drawings are graphic pictorial representations of the contract documents. Pretty simple on here. So that's, and, and the drawings, this is the exact same definition that you're going to see in the um, B101. Okay? Next. The specifications. Specifications, a portion of the contract documents consistent of written requirements. So like the drawing specifications are the written part. When you guys work on, you guys probably don't do, or do you, do you guys ever do any specification drafting or anything in your classes? Yes or no? Okay. When I work on my projects, you're going to find, so a traditional, um, mo like if you're going to have a house, if, if you're going to hire an architect to design a house, they're going to do your plans. The specifications are probably going to be, so there's going to be a cover page, and then you open the cover page. Specifications are probably going to be all written on one of those sheets, teeny, teeny, tiny little language, and talking about what everything has to do, and what your concrete specs are, and everything else. Maybe two or three pages at the most that are going to be in. And that will be part of the drawing package that the architect issues for a house. As projects get larger and larger, the specifications come off the set of drawings, and they're in an eight and a half by 11 set of books. So, as you guys know, I've talked a little bit about, like, I work on power plants. I'll do spec review to make sure that the terms and provisions in the specifications are consistent with the terms and provisions that are going to be in the contract. Because you don't want to have the specifications calling the work something and the contract calling the work something different, or, or whatever that might be. So you have to do specification review, or at least I do as a legal, uh, one of the services I offer my clients. For a power plant, my specification book may be 3,000 pages long. So it's going to be two volumes that are going to be three or four inches long. So that's on a massive project with lots and lots and lots and lots of detail and everything else. So you're going to have everything from a couple pages on some drawings to thousands and thousands of pages. But that's what the specifications are. And depending on what you're doing, you'll be writing specifications sometime in your career. Next. Instruments of services. I remember when I first read this provision, or this, this term, it was about, I think, I think they started using it 20 years ago in the 97s, but I'm not positive. It may have been in the 87s, but I think in the 97s it came in. I'm like, what the heck are the instruments of services? The instruments of services is basically the intellectual property of what you're doing. So it includes any medium of expression, now known or later developed, 
in the tangible and intangible creative work performed by the architect and the architect's consultants. It's what the designers are creating. So it's the plans, specifications, renderings, axonometrics, models, elevations, section cuts, anything that is a graphical or creative representation of the project. And that's what you guys will own. When you're out there practicing in the business and the profession, you own your instruments of services. Now, they, when, when you get in, if you look at, um, in Article 7 is where they define it in the B101, there's a long laundry list of everything in here. They have a lot of them in here, you know, studies, surveys, models, everything else. It's even longer in the B101. But they define that as the instruments of service. Again, the consistency between the B101 and the A series here. Um, and it'll say that the architect is the author and owner of the instruments of services. I think in the last eight or ten years, I've started to see this term find its way into other form contracts or other just contracts that businesses use. Um, but predominantly, it's an AIA term. But you'll know anytime you see the word instruments of services, it's your intellectual property rights. Initial decision maker. We covered this briefly under the B101. So that's the hat that the architect wears where sometimes they're going to be the independent neutral. Contractor says, the plans can't tell me everything I need to do in order to finish out this room. I need a change order because the plans aren't clear and they submit to the owner for a change order. Or the soils aren't what they're supposed to be and they submit for a change order. And every one of those they're going to ask for probably time and money because it's a change to the project. It's not what I bid. Owner says, well, I don't know. Or maybe they know and they disagree. You know, it depends on how sophisticated your owner is. So the initial decision maker is looked to be the architect. And the architect, and it's defined in the B101 again, the architect will be that initial decision maker to say, okay, I'm listening to the contractor's story, I'm listening to the owner's story, here's where I think this shakes out. If you recall, when we were talking about the B101, sometimes that puts the architect in kind of an awkward position because the contractor's complaining about the architect's drawings. So is the architect really being neutral when they're trying to both say, does the contractor deserve a change order while they're defending the, the sufficiency of the drawings? But by and large, they have to have somebody. And so they designate in the B101 that it's the architect, and the A201 recognizes that's what they are. Okay. 1.2, the correlation and intent of the contract documents. The contract documents is to the intent of the, and it's the intent, it's not the guarantee, it's the intent. That words like that have meaning to me as the lawyer. It's like, well, it's what they're supposed to mean, but they don't have to be perfect. You gotta remember, no matter what you do as an architect, you will never, ever design a perfect building. And you will never complete a set of 100% complete drawings. You just won't and you don't need to. You don't need to draw that every detail of where the nails go or where the bolts go. The contractor knows how to do that. So it's the intent of the contract documents to include all items necessary for the proper execution and the completion of the work by the contractor. Basically, it's saying to the contractor, here are the contract documents, plans and specs predominantly, but there may be more information in there. You can take this and you can build the project. The intent of what I'm handing you is the contract documents, which remember includes the contract, is to allow the contractor to properly build it and have charge what they're gonna charge. So that's the intent. Um, contract documents are complementary and what is required shall be binding as if required by all. So it's binding on everybody too. Performance by the contractor should be required only to the extent consistent with the contract documents and reasonably inferable from them being necessary to produce the project. So as you, as I said, no set of drawings and no set of specifications will be 100%. So the architect, when it draws up, a series of columns and tells you how big those columns are supposed to be. The steel, you know, here's what the flange is and here's what the, the height is. And, 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 you're, and then the architect or the contractor goes out and buys that red steel and puts it up, or the contractor buys it and puts it up. The architect expects the contractor to be able to read the drawings and figure out how to bolt the things together. One of the things, that, as, as I say using bolts as an example, because Again, the architect is not responsible for figuring out where the bolt holes go. I've had, in my career, three pieces of litigation 
where the bolts of bolting the column to the ground was not sufficient, and one of those three also included that they over the bolts, and as a result, the column was skewed, and that caused structural problems throughout the building. Architect doesn't draw the bolt diagram. That's the subcontractor when they create shop drawings. Architect reviews it, says things right, but the architect doesn't do that. It's reasonably inferable that if I show a column and I tell you as the architect I've done the structural analysis of this is the size of column you need and it will support the weights, that then the contractor takes that drawing and what's reasonably inferable and it's subcontractor that fabricates the steel will understand how to do the bolt connections and figure out what the bolt diagram is and then proceed forward. So this is a one-to-one one here is basically saying, I'm going to give you these contract documents and everything you need to do the project and build it, but you as the contractor have to do some of your own work. You have to, what's reasonably inferable, you've got to figure that out. So that's what this is saying. Okay? Yeah. So the bolt, no, the bolt diagram is not going to be fall to the structural engineer. So what's going to happen is the structural engineer is going to figure out, I have to have um, column and beam systems. So I need to know what my loads are going to go on it. So that's on the design side. And they're going to structurally engineer to make sure that, that the column is strong enough, the span between column to column by the beam going across is not too much so that the, the, uh, that the beam is going to flex and you're going to have you know, bowing or sagging. The structural engineer is going to figure that out. How that column connects to that beam, or how that column is bolted to the concrete pad that is poured, is up to the, is up to the subcontractor fabricator. The fabricator of that steel will do the bolt diagrams. They'll send it to the architect to look at it, but they are going to do the math on the bolt connections for both the ground and the bus. So there, and that is something that's industry standard, and everybody knows that. So that's what shop drawings are. And there are, there's a handoff between what the architect is designing and what the specialty people have to do. So when the architect goes in, for example, and says, um, we need to have a wet, a wet uh, uh, fire protection system, and it needs to follow this code, that's all the architect's going to say. They're not going to design where these pipes are going to go, whether it's a wet system or dry system. They're not going to design how many sprinkler heads there's going to be above. That all goes to the fire protection subcontractor. And they're going to take over that element. So there's a handoff. And through your practice in the profession, as you work more in the industry, you will learn where those handoffs happen. Um, same thing for, like, electrical. The architect is going to put um, on it drawings. They're going to say, well, there's a plug here and a plug here and a switch here. They're not going to design where the conduit's going to go behind the walls. They're not going to say whether it's too, how the side... All of that's going to be taken care of by the electrical subcontractor and how the conduit system works. So there's this handoff. Architect will look at certain things to make sure that an electrical conduit's not going through the same place as a plumbing conduit, because you don't want to have the electrical and water. But by and large, that's that handoff, and that's what's reasonably inferable from the contract documents. Just to give you one teeny tiny little war story. So early in my career, um, I represented a... a, uh, a uh, uh, an engineering consulting firm that would come in for remediation and fixing buildings. You know, if there's something was going wrong, they weren't the designers up front, they were the ones that come in and say, here's what was wrong, whether it was design or construction, and here's the fix. So there was a project out in 26 in California where they were doing some of the new jails. Um, they had the old ones, and then they were adding some new jail cells out there. And one of the things that happened was, um, over the course of construction, the, the roof structure between floors was a series of concrete planks, precast concrete planks. So you put up the wall and then you lay these planks next to each other, next to each other. They were T-shaped, okay? And they were preformed, precast, and everything else. And then the ceiling would hang below that. And the reason why they did that is they needed to have specialty requirements for, because it was a prison, of, of security, and they had to have certain how the spaces worked and everything else. And in that space, so if you imagine a series of planks that are T's, so you would have these little alcoves, in those spaces was where the home runs or the conduit would go for the electrical as well as the plumbing. So all of that stuff was being done. You have to coordinate when it's being built. In the meantime, um, the floors, if you, like, if you, let's imagine these tabletops, as you push these tabletops together, 
They'll meet, but they'll still be gaps. And so the design included, do the concrete planks, put the tables together, or push them together, and you know, you have these little gaps. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pour a four-inch solid concrete layer on top of it. So they had everything ready, they brought in the trucks, and they poured concrete on top of it so that the, the, the prisoners couldn't ship through and get below. What they didn't do when they were doing this, what the contractor failed to do, was clean the tops of these concrete planks. Dust, candy wrappers, there was coffee cups, all this crap was there. And so what ended up happening was that the concrete pour didn't stick. And so it delaminated. So you had this concrete that was kind of wavy and cracking, and it didn't stick to the top of the floor. So my client was brought in to take a look at how to fix this. And they had had this exact same scenario in a parking garage, where it was the same concrete planks, and they had poured, and the concrete had delaminated. And what they did in that one is they cut a series of holes in this four-inch concrete, and they put in this little machine, and they put in this viscous epoxy. It was like this ooey gooey stuff that would seep and find all the gaps and holes and fill it in and then hard as rock. After it would harden after 24 hours, it was hard as rock. So it would take care of it and it would make the top concrete stick to the plank. So you had to come in and you had to pump these in and these guys came in and they cut all these holes about eight inches and they set up all over these series of floors. And what they didn't know, timing-wise, and what the contractor, the general contractor, hadn't coordinated with was the electrical conduits and the plumbing conduits and all the piping that was run, none of it was capped. So my client came in with their big gooey machines and sat there and was like chug, 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 and all this ooze was going in and doing its job and finding all the open conduits. And so there was people working in the, sh in the, 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 the showers down below and it started coming out of the shower head like Play-Doh. It was green, and it, or, or blue, and it was yellow. It just started oozing out of the shower heads. And then it started coming out of the light fixtures, this epoxy, because it filled every single conduit on that floor. And it was millions of dollars of damage. There's a shot of a, of a um, junction box where all of the conduit comes in, and you know that's where the circuit breakers are and everything else that, that comes in. And it's got all these things that are all oozing out, like Play-Doh, all this green and this blue and yellow thing. It was, it was kind of, it was not a great case for my client, but um, that's one of the problems with uh, where the handoff and who's responsible for it. Wasn't the engineer, the engineer was there to do the fix, but his job isn't responsible for coordinating what was going on with the conduit. That should have been done by the contractor. That's these handoffs that happen, okay? All right, moving on. One, two, one, one. The invalidity of any provision of the contract document should not invalidate the contract. So one of the things that happens in contracts is sometimes you may have a provision that either by a certain state, their, their law says that this is not a legal provision or maybe a law changes. And so this is just saying, you know what? If there's a, one provision in here, it doesn't invalidate the whole contract. They stand on their own. Um, but it says if it's determined that any provision of the contract violates the law or otherwise is invalid and enforceable, then those provisions shall be revised. So it's giving the parties a chance to make them right. If they're illegal, invalid, we've talked about void and voidable, those types of things in early in our class. So if those things come up, that's what, that's what this provision does. It gives the parties a chance to kind of make sure that if the law changed or there wasn't understanding of the law, they can come back and, and make it right. Okay? Um, one, two, two, and one, two, three just talked about how the specifications and contract documents work together. Not, not as relevant. One three, capitalization, that's just a provision that says if you see it's capitalized, it's a term of art. Um, one four, interpretation, that's a provision that talks about, it's a long provision that says uh, plurals and singulars are the same, so party or parties, it's, it's more of legal defining terms, so you don't have to worry about that as well. One five, ownership and use of drawing specifications or other instruments of services. And here it says, just like in Article 7 of the B101, the architect and architect's consultant shall be deemed the authors and owners of their respective instruments of services, including drawing specifications, etc., etc. This language will mirror that provision in Article 7.1 of the B101. And it's to tell the contractor, you don't own it, the owner doesn't own it, these are the architect's drawings. Okay? So same thing. You're going to find a lot of consistencies between them. Um, one five two. The contractors, subcontractors, suppliers, etc., are authorized 
to use and reproduce the instruments or services subject to written established protocols in sections 171 page solely in exclusion for the execution of the work. So the authorization, if you remember in Article 7 of the B101, it talked about a license was being granted. I'm the architect and I own my instruments of service. I grant to you, owner, a license that you can use my instruments of services without violating my copyright to build your project. You, owner, also are authorized, that's why the word authorized here is, is to provide that same license to your contractors. It's a technical piece, but the reality here is when someone takes a set of plans, when a contractor or a subcontractor takes a set of plans and builds from that, if they don't have a license, they are violating the copyright. So what you, where this play comes into play is, owner puts up a high rise and his plan or her plan, it's a condo building, is to build phase two. Architect designs phase one, owner builds phase one, Three years later, owner decides to go forward with phase two and puts up a matching tower right next door. If the owner uses those same drawings, it's going to be the same building. If the owner uses the same drawings without getting a new license, the owner's committing copyright violation. If the contractor is building that without that license, they're committing copyright violation. And the architect can come in and can enjoin and stop that project and say, you cannot build because you're violating my copyright. You need to pay me the value of these drawings. And so if the architect got paid a million dollars for the first phase, they can make an argument they should get paid a million dollars for the second phase, even if they don't have to do any more work because the drawings have value. So that's what this is recognizing here. It's solely and exclusively for the execution of the work. In this case, the work is defined for this project only. Does that make sense? The drawing is whose? Well, when I negotiate on behalf of an owner, I try to get the owner to own the, to be the owner of the drawings. Rarely do I get an architect to agree to that, but occasionally you do. So, like, if you're a governmental entity, um, sometimes when the RFP goes out, you say, we're going to own all the drawings. And, and so the architect, when they're bidding, know that they're not going to own it. But that, that depends. I'm negotiating a contract right now where the owner is adamant that they want to own the drawings, and the, con the architect will not give them ownership. So we are now negotiating a very narrow license. The architect will always own the, the instruments of service, but the license is a very narrowly drafted license which says not only can the owner only use it for this project, but the architect can't use the creative elements that are in this project for any of its other ones. So it actually kind of has a, a fallback where it says, because there are specific creative elements that are indicative only to my client's business, and we don't want those being reproduced by our competitors. And if this architect goes and gets hired by one of our competitors, we don't want them to be able to use our designs with them. So we, they won't give us the ownership, but we're negotiating a very narrow, but broad, uh, narrow band license. So, okay. Um, 1.6. So this is... Um, uh, a provision that's a little bit different than before. So it says, except as otherwise provided 162, where the contract documents require one party to notice or give notice to the other party, such notice shall be provided in writing. The reason why this is different than what it was before was in the last round, the 2007s, sometimes it would say notice needs to be provided, and sometimes it would say notice needs to be provided in writing. And so what the arguments were made is if notice was given and no written, no writing of the notice, it was just a phone call or a conversation in the field, and it was hard to track, one side would say, well, I gave you notice, and, and it just says I have to give you notice. And they're like, but you were supposed to give it in writing. And they'll say no, because other parts of the contract specifically say it must be in writing. So unless it specifically says, you know, paragraph 10 says in writing, paragraph 8.2 says just notice. So they obviously are different. The AIA has recognized that doesn't make sense and you don't want to have to pick and choose. So what they're saying is, is any time in this contract where it says notice, it shall be provided in writing. So if you fail to give it in writing, you haven't given proper notice. So now it's kind of a blanket statement across the board. That's a change and legally it has an impact. So it's, it's relevant. If you guys are in a situation, and it's the same for the, the owner-architect agreement. 
If you're in a situation where you're required to give notice of something, do it in writing. Make sure there's a written record of it. 162. Notice of claims that is provided in section 15.1.3 shall be provided in writing and shall deem to be duly served as if only delivered to the designated representative of the party to whom the notice is addressed, etc., etc. So this says not only does it need to be in writing, but it tells you the manner of how that writing, that notice needs to be provided. And that's because it's for a claim. And a claim is where the contractor says, I should be paid more for this. Or, I should be getting more schedule time for this. What will happen in this situation that will cause the reason for a claim, is the contractor will come across something during the project and say, well, this isn't what I thought, this is what I did, and he'll, they'll submit a change order request. If the owner and or the architect deny the change order request and say, you should have reasonably inferred this from the drawings. You could have tell you you can tell you build this all the time. You should know that this is required by the drawings. So no, I'm not going to approve your change order. Go ahead and build the project. If the contractor still disagrees with that, they're going to file a claim. It's after a change order has been rejected. That claim, according to 161, needs to be identified in, in writing and addressed or certified registered mail. You have to have it. And if it's not delivered this way, then there's an argument that your claim is not valid. Okay? Uh, one seven. Digital data use and transformation, transmission. So this talks about, there's a provision, there's a document, an AIA document. Remember there's the A and B and C series as uh, subcontractors and consultants. Well, now they also have an E series. In the E-series or anything, we talk about electronic documentation. So that document, digital data protocol document, the E203, um, talks about, or this is actually the BIM model, building information modeling. It talks about how if you're going to use certain types of electronic transmission or, and, and building information modeling, which is a certain type of design system, um, you need to kind of follow that rules. I say probably only about 20 or 20, 30 percent of my contracts use any of these additional exhibits. Depends on how sophisticated the owner is, depends on how sophisticated the architect is, whether they're going to be using BIM or something else. Um, you guys will get out there in the industry and I guarantee by the time you guys are really into your practice and everything else, BIM will be something different. They, they change or it'll be more refined. Um, and then the contract documents, because they're done every 10 years, they try to keep up. So you may or may not be using those. Um, you may recall, like in, um, in the B101, Article 1.6 was the sustainable documents. I think that's the E204. And that was whether you're going to have a green sustainable protocol. And that, that's something that's an additional document. So that's just referencing that. This, this is how you're going to have digital information exchange and how the project will be designed and built um, using certain digital media. One eight, um, again, more about that, building information modeling, use and reliance. This, again, talks a little bit about the E203 and BIM. Uh, none of this will be in the exam, and, and I, but I just want you to be highlighted that, that BIM is something, at least the ARCIS, the AIA recognizes that it's in the industry, that it's used, and so there are provisions in there to tell the party, if you're going to be using BIM, see this other document, work on those terms and conditions to try to figure out what the protocols will be. All right. That's your series of general conditions, or your general provisions going in from the opening. All right, now we're going to talk about the owner. So this, that Article 2 is going to say, these are the duties and obligations of the owner. Then Article 3 will be the contractor, Article 4 is the architect, and Article 5 is the subcontractor. So that's what we're going to get through, kind of the four main parties involved in a contract. Okay. Um, the owner shall designate in writing a representative who shall have the express authority to bind the owner with respect to all matters requiring the owner's approval or authorization. Except as otherwise provided in 421, the architect does not have such authority. So this, if you remember, there was a provision in the B101 that says, unless otherwise stated in this agreement, the architect does not have the authority to act on behalf of the owner. And there's like three or four places in the B101 that says, Architect has the authority. It's for like uh, inspections. It's for testing. So there's a few things that the architect has the authority. That's why this is recognizing. It says, except for 421, which is will mirror what's in the B101, the architect has no authority to act on behalf of the owner. 
That's good for two reasons. One, the owner doesn't want the architect kind of going out on the project, kind of directing traffic without the owner approving. So that's a protection for the owner that the architect isn't acting and getting over their skis. It's a protection for the contractor, too. If the architect's out in the field and says to the contractor, you know what, you need to move this wall. This wall's in the wrong spot. It needs to go from here to there. Contractor has already built that wall and has incurred costs for that. If they're going to move the wall because the architect tells them what to do, they feel that they should get paid for it. But this tells them, don't listen to the architect. You have to get authority from the owner because the architect is going to have the authority to tell you to move that wall. That's where the change order process comes in. Okay? Um, the designation in writing is the owner needs to identify. Here is my project representative. This is the individual that will speak on behalf of me. Sometimes it's an employee of the owner's company. Sometimes they hire an outside company that speaks on behalf of the owner. Again, depending on the complexity of the project and the sophistication of the owner. But you need to have that individual or designated couple of individuals that is, they are the people that talk to the contractor. Nobody else. You don't want to have, you know, one vice president from the owner showing up and telling the contractor, this is the way my office should be, and another vice president coming up and saying, no, you need to change these hallways. You can have a single point of responsibility. So that's what that does. 2-2. Okay. Two, two. Evidence of the owner's financial arrangements prior to the commencement of work. So before the contractor actually has to start work and request to the contractor, the owner shall furnish reasonable evidence to the contractor, reasonable evidence that the owner has financial arrangements to fulfill the owner's obligations under the contract. That's a good thing for the contractor if you think about it. Like, oh great, I'm going to do this $10 million project. I want to make sure I got, I'm going to get paid. So before I start work, Mr. Owner, after I've signed this contract, I want to see your financials. I want to see that you have a loan in place, or I want to see proof that you have the money to pay me. We can't enter into this business deal on just trust and love. We want to be able to ask for that. So this gives the language, this gives the opportunity to the contractor to say, let me see it. As an owner representative, I try to stake this provision all the time. It's like, look, it's none of your business what my financials are. And what we end up doing is we, what will end up is it will be a happy medium where we can see very narrowly what's available that the owner has, but they can't get into the whole set of books and records. So you kind of, all right, I understand you don't want to start working without seeing that I have my loan in place but I'm not going to give you my loan documents. I'm going to show you here's what the bank has approved or here's what's going to go through the title company or what have you. So I'll give you the assurance, but I'm not going to see, let you see really behind the curtain. That's my business, not yours. So you have to kind of figure out how to negotiate that happy medium. 2-2. Two, two. Following the commencement of the work, so after you started, and upon written request by the contractor, the owner shall furnish the contractor reasonable evidence that the owner has made financial arrangements to fill owner obligations, blah, blah, blah. So this is, so the, the first provision was before you could ask, the contractor can ask. This is, well, after the project starts, something may happen. The owner's business may tank. You know, the project's going on for two years and the owner gets a hit in the financial market. You know, do they have the financial wherewithal to continue? So that's if, and this only triggers under these three things. One, if the owner fails to make payments to the contractor. So if you don't pay me, I want to see that you have the money. And you're allowed to ask for that. Two, contractors identifies in writing a reasonable concern regarding the ability to make payment. I just saw that your company took a 60% dive in the stock market because of, of a bad product or what have you. I'm concerned that we have to get paid for the next eight months on this project. I want to see that you have the money available for me because I see your company's tanking. Or three, a change in the work that materially, materially changes the contract sum. We negotiated that you were going to build me a $2 million house. I was going to build you a $2 million house. Before I started work, you showed me that loan that you have to pay me the $2 million. You have done so many change orders that the price of this house is now $2.9 million. That has materially changed. This isn't a 10% increase. This is a major increase to the value of the project. Another $800,000 that I'd be on the hook for since it's materially changed. I, contractor, want to see your owner's ability to pay me the additional sums. Only under those three can the contractor, after the project has started, ask for more financial information. 
but down, coming down here, this is kind of a clawback to the owner. However, if the request is made because of the changes materially changes the contract sum under three above, the contractor may also immediately stop that portion of the work affected by the change until reasonable evidence is presided. So if there's this $800,000 addition, you know, we're going to add a pool and a game room and a three-car garage to your $2 million house, and that comes in as another 800000 the contractor can say, tell me, show me, I don't have to work on that stuff. That's one of the things here. And then there should be a contract extension. The contract time shall be extended appropriately, um, and the contract sum shall be increased by the amount. If you're going to add more stuff to this project, of course I'm going to need more time to finish it. So you've got to give that to me. Not only do I get to see your financials to make sure you can pay me, but I am, I'm entitled to a contract extension. So, and that's not uncommon. I mean, not uncommon if there's one of these three items, it's not uncommon that there's that dialogue. It's, it's good business on both sides. So, as, as you want to think about it, the AIA, in recognizing, you know, we want to give everybody the proper duties and obligations, but we also want to make things that make good business sense. This is the provision for the contractor that makes good business sense. Any questions? Okay. Two, three. After the owner gives the evidence of financial arrangements, the owner shall not materially vary such financial arrangements without prior notice to the contractor. So, if the loan is in place, and they have those funds, they're earmarked for that. And then the owner wants to use those funds for something else, different projects, maybe to fund some new R&D in their business, whatever it might be, they are obligated to tell the owner as such. For example, I have a project right now. My client is building a project um, that's going to be about a $40 million project when it's all said and done. The loan is going to come in, and they're asking for... What's the collateral on the loan? And the, the, the backup, the collateral, was going to be certain um, equities that the business owned, but the bank didn't think that was sufficient. The business has a private investor, and that private investor, his investment is through a trust. And the trust is worth a significant amount of money, far in excess of the value of the project. So the trust, is going to be a financial arrangement that the bank is looking into. It's not the contractor, but the trust is going to show that the bank... So the, and so what's going to end up happening is the bank, if the trust decides to allocate the funds that are earmarked for this project elsewhere, the bank needs to know. That's the same thing that would happen here for the contractor. If there's an earmark of the funds coming from the bank, the contractor gets to see if the owner wants to use those funds for somewhere else. Okay? 224. Where the owner has designated the information furnished under Section 2.2 as confidential, the contractor shall keep the information confidential, not disclose, etc., etc. Um, and then it talks about may disclose the confidential information to its employees, consultants, so it gives some people to whom they can show that need to know this information. So, as I said, way back when we talked about the very first provision here, where I say I try to strike any obligation of my owner clients of telling the contractor what their financial background is or their financial wherewithal. But we end up ultimately negotiating a kind of narrow band where they get to see certain limited items. I always will express all of that information confidential. So the only people that can see that is the contractor and then their employees so they can analyze it and their subcontractors, anybody working on the project. That prevents the contractors from sharing that information with other contractors, with businesses, with the paper, the press, whatever it might be, because my financial background is important and it's not for everybody's consumption. So, this is a protection in 224 for the owner. 23. Information and services required. Did you have a question? Yeah. 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 So the question is, so I'll just make sure, the question is, does the, does the contractor have an ability to independently verify the financial wherewithal of the owner? Um, the answer is mostly no, but there are ways that the contractors can kind of assess it. So, for example, the banks will never release any individual or company's financial information without authorization for that. They are under 
that FDIC laws and other laws and everything else, that any information, how much you have in your savings account, how much I have in my savings account, or whatever it is, will never release that information to a third party unless you or I tell them that they can do that. So it's not going to be by a phone call or, or trying to do that. The way, an, a, way a contractor could, could do that analysis is they could go in, if it was a publicly traded company, they could look at to see what their, what their filings are because they have to file their, their um, uh, at the end of the year, their year-end reports or their quarterly reports with the SECs. And those will be made available to the public. And what they report in the SECs will have liabilities and assets and you can go ahead and read those public statements. You can do a, a Dun & Bradstreet's report. So there are various institutions that are out there that track certain types of companies and their financial uh, marketability and everything else. So you can get some information, but to actually know the funds earmarked for it, likely not. If you're dealing with the federal, a, a state or federal or local government, you can do that analysis. You can actually go and submit a FOIA request to find out where their financials are because the funds that are owned by any governmental entity are your funds because they're coming from Texas. So it depends on the project and it depends on what level you want to dig down deep. But you're never going to get directly what the bank has and what's in their accounts. Not without the authorization. That's a good question though. Okay. So what else for information does the owner have to provide? 231. The owner shall secure and pay for necessary approvals, easements, assessments, and charges required for construction, for use of occupancy and permanent structures with permanent changes in the existing facilities. So here, if there's going to need to, if you need to go to a zoning commission and you have to have um, an easement or any changes that you need, so that's going to make sure that the land can be built or the project can be built on the land where it's going to be built. So the owner's responsible for providing and paying for those. It's not up to the contractor to pay for an easement. If there's going to be a driveway on the neighbor's project or the neighbor's property that's going to be shared, owner has to be take care of that. That's a service and a, and a fee that they have to pay for. 232. The owner shall retain the architect lawfully license to practice architecture. Well, you know, that makes kind of sense it's if, you're, if we're doing the traditional triangle. Um, the owner hires the architect, not the contractor, and they have to be licensed because the contractor, the last thing the contractor wants to do is build off of drawings that are not legal in that state. Can't hire a, a, an Ohio architect to design something in Illinois if they're not licensed in Illinois. And the contractor certainly doesn't want to build that because you're dealing with illegal drawings. Um, one caveat to what I said in the very beginning, the A series of documents, 101, 102, 103, 104, will always work with this document. The caveat is there's a design build series, A141. And that's where the owner hires a single entity that's a designer and the builder. And as a result, because the owner's hiring the one entity that does design build, clearly the owner's not retaining just the architect because they're retaining them. And so this provision, 232, is not used and they have, they, they have a special design build set of general conditions. So there's the, um, the A201 for the design build, A141. Let's see. And there are a couple of nuances there, but I just wanted to point out there are sometimes we're not using this, but by and large, the A201 is going to be used for that. Um, and then 23 just talks about at the end of terminating the, the architect and what the contractor gets and the owner has to do. So those are obligations by the owner. 234. The owner shall provide surveys describing the physical characteristic and legal limitations and the utility locations of the site, legal description, etc., etc. So... That's when the, when, you, when the contractor comes in and wants to build a project, they need to know, survey, where are the landlines? Where are the property descriptions? I want to make sure that when I dig this hole, I am not digging into the neighbor's property. And I'm allowed to rely on it. I'm not going to go out and pay for the survey. The owner is. And in fact, even when you do, um, I don't know if anybody here owns a residence or owns a home, but like even when you do a closing on a home, one of the things that the bank requires is that you go in and you survey the property where your home is going to be to make sure that what the seller is telling you they're selling you is exactly what you're buying and the survey that they've provided, seller, matches the survey that the owner's getting. So it makes sense here in construction, contractor doesn't have to go out and do the survey, they just build where you tell them to, owner has to provide the surveys for that. Also, um, and then physical characteristics, legal description of physical characteristics, there may be you know, where the rocks are, trees are, those types of things. 
two, three, five. The owner shall inform- furnish information and services required of the owner by the contract documents with reasonable promptness. So, anything above or anything throughout the contract documents where it says the owner has to provide that, this says you got to do it with reasonable promptness. So, if I'm a contractor and I submit a change order that says you want me to add, uh, make your two car garage into a three car garage, that's going to cost another $38,000 and I'm going to need another two weeks to the schedule to do that. And the contractor submits that change order to the owner. The owner has to review and approve that. This says the owner needs to return that review and approval in reasonable promptness. If it takes the owner a month and a half to approve that change order, the contractor is going to say, that two-week schedule extension is now going to be four because I had to revamp where I'm building. I've already done that. Now I've got to move over. So this keeps the, con- the owner uh, in check for making sure the schedule that the contractor has put together stays and continues the way the contractor wants it. They are allowed, they being the contractor, the it, being, uh, it is allowed to rely on the owner also sticking to the schedule. Because as we all know, in any construction project, time is money. All right? Any questions on that? 2.4. The owner's right to stop the work. This is actually a very powerful provision in a contract, but one that you don't really want to recommend the owner to do on any type of regular basis. What this says is if the contractor fails to correct work, so fails to correct means that they've already, whether it's the architect or the owner, has already determined that something was wrong, has given the contractor notice, fix your error, And so now we're in a situation where the contractor has failed to correct that error. So if that happens, or they repeatedly fail to carry out work, they just, it's not a, it's not a defect, but they are delinquent. They don't staff the project with enough workers or whatever the process is. They miss schedule dates. The owner may issue a written order to the contractor to stop the work or any portion thereof until the cause for such order has been eliminated. So what this does is this says, the owner says to the contractor, I'm, I'm tired of you not fixing this. You have to fix this. So I'm going to make you stop the work, and any delay is not my fault, it's your fault because you have failed to fix it. Or until you get enough workers on the project site. You need to do your job. This is a provision that says, I, owner, can tell you, contractor, to do your job, and if you're not doing it, I'm going to make you stop it until you do, until you figure out and fix the problem. Now, the reason why you don't want to tell the, con- the owner to do this on a regular basis is because what if the owner's wrong? What if the defect was actually caused by the design? You better be on pretty good grounds before you tell the contractor to stop work, because when they stop they're going to hit you with claims and change orders and delays and it's going to be a big fight and that's when I'm going to be brought in. So, I had a, a, a big case where they wanted to do, they wanted to 2.4 the contractor I don't know how many times and I said, no, 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 no. And finally the board just came in and said, we have to do this. And I said, okay, here's what's going to happen. We're going to exercise 2.4 and we're going to tell them to stop the work and I said, within Within seven days, you're going to have 25 lawsuits filed. And that's what happened. And so we litigated for the next two and a half years. It was great work for me, but it was not the best for the project. And what they ended up finally doing is negotiating a lot of these out, which they could have done earlier on, but it created a lot of animosity, a lot of tension between the owner and the contractor. The contractor did a poor job anyway. They had lots of their own faults. And financially, um, we ended up negotiating a, a, a very good deal for my client, but it still was, like, this is kind of like the nuclear option. Telling the contractor to stop is something that you don't want an owner to do unless they really, really know what they're doing. 2.5. This is kind of works in conjunction with 2.4, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not the nuclear option saying stop work. But it says, if the contractor defaults or neglects to carry out the work in accordance with the contract documents, so similar to 2.4, if they fail to do the work, 
within a 10 period after notice, a 10 day period after receipt of notice from the owner to commence and continue correction. So what happens is there's a defect, there's a failure to do perform work, whatever it is. The owner sends a letter to the contractor, fix this, change this, get your act together. Within 10 days of sending that letter, um, if the contractor hasn't started to fix things, if it hasn't continued correction of some default and negligence or diligence, the owner may, without prejudice to the other remedies, if they ever have such default, cor- correct such default and negligence. So what they can do, the, on- the owner can come in and say, okay, part of our project has a sewer system. And we're, gonna, we're having problems with the drain backing up. We're, we're, you know, we're three quarters away into this project. Your plumbing company that laid down the pipes where the sewer system was going to go to connect to the cities um, finished that work six months ago. But it wasn't open and active. Now it is. And we're getting back up. Water is backing up into these office pipe portions elsewhere. You need to fix that. Contractor says, well, no, no, no. We did it right. Well, well, why is it backing up? Well, that's because of this, this, and this. It's not our fault. It's something else. It's the city's fault. It's whatever it is. Well, that's not it. You need to fix that. We're going to send a letter that says, and I, in this one case, this is exactly what happened. We sent a 2.5 letter that said, you must correct this defect with the, with the plumbing and the sewage issue. And if you don't, within 10 days, we're going to bring in our own subcontractor to do it. They rejected our letter. They said it wasn't their fault. So after 10 days, we brought in a new plumbing com- subcontractor. They came in, they investigated, they found out, sure enough, the contractor had failed to do it right, or the subcontractor, their plumbing subcontractor, had failed to install the, the pipes in the system incorrect, uh, correctly. So my guy came in, my, our plumbers, and uh, came in and redid, had to rip up the concrete, had to rip up a lot of stuff, had to relay new pipe at the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars because it wasn't done correctly the first time, so you had to rip it all out and replace it. And we use this to say, we're not stopping the work. There was work going on all the rest of them. We're not going to 2.4 you. We're not shutting down the project. We're not telling you to stop the work. What we are going to do is we're going to bring in our own people to fix this. We fixed it, and then we said, this $280-some thousand dollars or whatever the figure was, we're back charging you. You could have taken care of it on your own and figured it out with your subcontractor, but you didn't. So you owe us $280,000, and we use 2.5 for that. This is not quite the nuclear option of 2.4. It's not the best thing to do because what happens if you bring in your subcontractor and they rip it open and they find out, lo and behold, they, the, the first contractor did it correctly. Well, now you've incurred the cost. You can't pass that along to the subcontractor. So whatever costs that the, the investigative work to rip it up um, that your person you brought in, you have to pay for it. The owner has to pay for it. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a remedy that you can exercise without going so far as the 2.4 nuclear option. Um, that, the bottom part here is if current and future payments are not sufficient to cover such amounts, the contractor shall pay the difference to the owner. So what we did is we actually, on the next pay application, we held back the 280 some thousand dollars said, you're just not going to get it. We ended up working on a settlement negotiation. But if there was not money left, let's say it was the end of the project, the contractor would have owed the had to write us a check. So... And then obviously if the owner, if the contractor disagrees with the actions of the owner, the architect, they can make a claim under Article 15. And that's a claim that would require going back to the notice provision. It has to be in writing. It has to be certified mail. It has to be follow certain requirements because it's a claim with a capital C. Okay? And that's it for the owner's obligations. Now, the owner does a lot of other stuff on the project. There's a lot more communication. There's a lot of things that the owner does that's part and parcel to being an owner. But under this contract, that's all the owner is obligated to do. All right. Article 3, contractor. This one's a long one. So we'll get through this. And then we'll do subcontract or architects and subcontractors. Okay. The term contractor means the contractor and the contractor's authorized representatives, 311. So it just talks about it. So here again, the contractor is supposed to identify an authorized representative. It could be the project manager. Sometimes maybe it's the superintendent. Um, whoever is going to be their person. 312, the contractor shall perform the work in accordance with the contract documents. That's kind of like saying, 
you know, you got to put one foot in front of the other. Of course, that's what you need to do to walk. But it doesn't hurt to have a provision that says, you must do the work as the contract documents tell you. That's kind of the legal blocking that is. 313. The contractor shall not be relieved of its obligations to perform the work in accordance with the contract and the contract documents, either by the activities or duties of the architect and the architect's administration of the contract. What does that mean? Well, architect comes on site and does some stuff in administering it. If you remember from the B101, the architect is supposed to make sure that the project progresses in accordance with the intent of the drawings and that the project will come out as, as designed at the end. And it's kind of this general, you know, you're not supposed to know the means and methods. You don't watch every single thing. You're there once a week or once a month, whatever it is. So you have this general thing. If the architect walks around and misses something, doesn't see that the, that the wall was in the right spot in accordance with the contract documents, Yes, the architect has committed negligence in their administration of the contract. The architect should have caught that, but failed to. But simply because the architect failed to doesn't mean that the contractor also didn't fail to do its job because it put the wall in the wrong place. Basically, even though the architect's supposed to be somewhat of a watchdog, contractor can't say, they missed it, so I don't have any liability. Contractor can't say that. They can say they missed it, so we share, but the contractor also missed it. So that's what this provision 313 is saying. 3.2. Review the contract documents and field conditions by the contractor. By execution of the contract, so the contractor signs this, they are representing that they visited the site, had become generally familiar with the local conditions, of the word of work, and correlated personal observations with the requirements of the contract documents. So if the contract documents show that it's going to be a flat project, and the contractor walks out and sees it's on a rolling hill, and signs the contract, they can't come back later and say, well now i got to do a bunch of earthworks to make it flat. Because it's hilly here, and i got to make a flat space. The owner's going to say, yeah, but you said you visited the site and you walked around with the drawings, and you saw that it needs to be flat, you gave me a price for that. Sure, it's hilly, but you saw that. You visited it, and you had personal observations. When you signed it, you bought into it. You can't get a change order to flatten the hills, to cut that earth. That's your issue, not mine. That's what that says. Because the contract documents are to business of 322, because they're complementary, the contractor shall... It shall is one of those legal terms. It's really funny. I was watching CNN the other night, and um, they were talking about the term shall in, in, a, in a statute they're going to be using in a recently served subpoena by the Congress. And they had some lawyer on, and uh, he was not one of their usual pundits. And he's like, they will not be able to object to this because shall means shall. I'm like, you can't do that. You can't say shall means shall. You have to say what shall means. Shall means must. Shall means they have to. You've got to give something more than shall means shall. And I was like watching going, you need to get somebody to change you better. Shall. They have to. They must. Carefully study and complete various, uh, the various contract documents relative to the portion of the work as well as other information prover- provided by the owner. Take field measurements of any existing conditions related to the portions of the work. And it shall observe the conditions of the site affecting it. Again, they have to be able to say these drawings and where I'm going to be building it. This is requiring the contractor to take further steps. They cannot just say, I took the drawings on blind faith and now I'm walking into a building and like the field measurements, you know, well, the contractor, the architect's design say that the building is going to be 100 feet wide, but the property is only 90 feet wide. How are we going to do that? The contractor has an obligation to inform the owner and go through that. So, these obligations are the purpose of facilitating coordination and construction by the contractor, but this is the benefit for the contractor here, but are not for the purposes of discovering errors, omissions, or inconsistencies in the contract documents. So the contractor doesn't have to do the architect's job. If there are errors or omissions in the drawings, that's the architect's fault, and the contractor's not there to check the math. They are not there to see if there are errors or omissions. 
but there's a clause, a carve-out. However, the contractor shall promptly report to the architect that any errors of consistencies or omissions discovered or made known to made known to the contractor. So if the contractor discovers it in their normal review and coordination, then they have to tell the architect. But they don't have to look for it. They don't have to have their own architect on staff to see that the drawings were proper or not. They, they, they are able to rely on that if the drawings were done to code. But if the contractor knows that something in the drawings, if they have discovered it, someone told them about it, then they have an obligation. So they, they have a kind of, the first part of the clause is to get out of jail, but then there's a clause that says you have to be reasonable. What I try to do in this provision, and when you guys get out in the industry, if you ever want to tell your owner this, I try to say, made known or knew or should have known. That way you can say, well, even if somebody didn't directly tell you, and even if you can, I can't prove that you directly knew it, if I can say as a sophisticated, reasonable contractor you should have known, then I can put a little more risk back on them. Mm, I'd say about 50% of the contractors push back on that and we have a little discussion about it, but sometimes they get it through. It puts a little bit more obligation on the contractor to do their job. So, that's 322. Two, two. Any questions on that? Yeah. So is your question if, if it's, say, a design-build contract where the contractor and the architect are on the same side? It's not the triangle. It's owner and design-builder? So, so explain me, ask your question again. Yeah. The designer and the contractor are in the same company. Okay, whether they're separate people or not or whatever. So, so the question for that is, um, the answer is that do, does the contractor have to check the math? The answer is yes, because what's going to happen is, is the owner is going to enter into a design-build contract with a design builder that says, you must do all the things to design it properly and all the things to build it properly. Now, normally, what's going to happen is that design-build entity, if you remember from our slides where we had the kind of the different bubble diagrams and stuff, there's going to, that design-built entity will have a designer and a builder as two different companies that come together to create that single design-build entity. So that designer and that builder both have their own independent obligations and they're going to do them separately. But the owner only cares that I, owner, have entered into one, client, one contract with one company that has the whole gamut. And I don't care whether you or you should have checked your other's math. Somebody should have. And so that's an instance where the contractor or whoever the entity is will be obligated to make sure that the drawings are to code or what have you. And that's why the owner wants to do design build, is they don't want to have the multi-step of different parties. So that's a good question. Okay. Moving on. 323. Three. The contractor is not required to ascertain that the contract documents are in accordance with impeccable code laws, statutes, ordinance codes, rules, and regs. So again, it's not going to be acting as the designer. So the designer to make sure that the documents are in accordance with the laws and statutes. I'm a contractor. You're giving me a set of drawings. You're telling me that I can build off of these. They're legal. They're to code. They're within the, the parameters of the meets and bounds of the property. I'm ready to go. That's my job is to build it. I don't have to check everybody else in the back. But again, because AIA documents have different people that help write them, it says, but the contractor shall promptly report to the architect any non-conformity discovered or made known, made known to the contractor. Again, if the contractor finds out that something was designed was in violation of a code or a law, and they know about it, they got to tell the architect and the owner. But they are not obligated to search that out. Contractors, though, depending on how sophisticated they are or what they do in the industry, they kind of know what's going on as far as, you know, like, there may be a, an ordinance that they change as far as how, like, the parking lots may go or whatever the handicap accessibility is or something to that effect. And they may see that the drawings don't have what they need to meet code or a new change in law. They'll know what the city wants faster than probably anybody. 
So that's where they would have to notify the owner of that. 324. If the contractor believes that any additional cost or time is involved because of clarifications or instructions, the architect issues in response to the contractor's notices, the contractor shall submit the claims as provided in Article 15. So that's if, hey, I'm going to need more time or more money because there's something that is not right in the drawing, so I have a claim. That's 15.2.2, or in Article 15. If the contractor fails to perform the obligations of Section 3.2.2, which we know back there, 322 is, is that um, they have to study the drawings and they have to do those sight lines and make sure that what I see will actually build on the site. Um, so it says if they fail to do 322 or 323, the contractor shall pay the cost and damages to the owner, subject to section 1517, that's the claim section, as would have been avoided if the contractor had performed such obligations. So what this is basically saying what Article 324 is saying is that um, A, if there is something missing in the drawings, I, contractor, am entitled to request a change order. I can get more time and more money and make that claim. If they say no, I make the claim pursuant to 15. But it, can, it allows me to clarify what I'm trying to clarify what's in the drawings and specs it allows me to get more money. That's what Part A of this provision says. But Part B says, I had some obligations up above in 322 and 323. I was supposed to look at the drawings. I was supposed to walk the site. I was supposed to make sure that the measurements worked. I had some of my own constructability obligations. And if I failed to do that, if I failed to do that and tell the owner of the architect that I saw something missing, not only can, do I not get the chance to come back and get a change order for that, if there are more costs for the projects to build what I should have noticed in the beginning, I owe that money back to the owner. Think about it. If I'm walking the site and I see that they have um, the, the drainage system is going to go in a certain area where I know the way the soils and the ground and the swells or whatever it might be, that that drainage system is not going to work. And I know that, or I become aware of that in my review of the drawings. And I tell the architect that before I dig the hole and put the drainage system in. It may cost more money because the architect has to do a redesign, and the new system that they put in may cost a little bit more money. But it's going to be cheaper to do it before the work is done. As opposed to, I blindly follow the drawings of the contractor, I install exactly what the architect designed, the sewer system doesn't work, and then we have to rip the whole thing out at the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars. If I could have avoided this problem early, because under 322 or 323, I walked the site, and I reviewed the drawings, and I did my constructability review, if I had been able to catch it up front, and I failed to, I have to pay for it on the back end. So that's what this section says. Now there could be, again, if it turns out that the drawings are wrong and there's going to be a change in everything else, they should be able to get time and money for that. So when you go to the architect in the beginning and say, hey, your sewer drawings aren't going to work here, they come back and say, okay, here's the new sewer system. Well, that's going to cost more money. And you go to the owner and say, they've changed the design. Here's the new sewer system. I want more money. And this says you're allowed to do that. So that's the, the, the plus and the minus of this provision. Okay? Article 3.3. 3. Supervision and construction procedures. The contractor shall supervise and direct the work, so that's their own people, using the contractor's best skill and attention. Now, if you think about it, contrast that to the uh, B101 standard of care ordinary skill of a professional providing as a similar architect in a similar locality for similar circumstances. Ordinary standard of care. Here, the contractor is its best skill. So that's kind of a big deal. They're providing that. That's because, you know, when the building goes up, if they just did, well, it's kind of ordinary, well, it may leak, it may not leak. There's that, what's that, there's that commercial. Have you guys seen those series of commercials? Where, where the doctor, like there's the family with the doctor and, and uh, like, so what do you think of it? And they're like, what do you think of this doctor? Use him for him. And the people are like, he's okay. 
And then the doctor strolls in, he's like, just got my license back. And they're like, you, you don't need, you don't deserve just okay. That, there's a, and there's a series of other ones. I remember the doctor one because I just saw it yesterday. But that's what this is saying. This is saying the contractor can't be just okay. The contractor has to be the best. The reason why it's okay for the ar- architect to stay ordinary is because it's an ordinary professional. They actually are a professional. So, um, going on. The contractor shall be solely responsible for and have the control over the constructions. Remember this from the B101? Means, methods, techniques, sequences, procedures, and for coordinating all of the work, blah, 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 including safety and otherwise. Remember it said in the B101, you have as the architect no responsibility for that. That's why it's here. Somebody had to take responsibility for it. They're the ones that are going to be building it. So they, the, they or it, the contractor, and it's all subs, are responsible for means and methods, technique, sequence, procedures, safety of the project. Somebody had to carry it. It's not going to be the owner, it's not going to be the architect, so it's the contractor. So this is the, the, the antithesis of your provision in the B101. Um, the architect shall value the proposed alternative. So this talks about if there's changes. Um, unless the obje- architect objects to the contractor's proposed alternative, so sometimes the, in the project with an alternative, they're going to say, um, architect, you guys were going to use a certain trust system that you designed using this trust. Contractor can go to the owner and say, we can use this trust, or we have this other type of trust that will do the same thing, that's cheaper. It's an alternative. Or they want to use this type of brick. We have these brick pavers for the driveway. Cheaper, maybe better, longer last. It's an alternative. So the architect can evaluate those. And unless they object to the contractor's proposed alternative, the contractor should perform the work using any alternative needs, methods, techniques. So there's sometimes where they change how they build stuff. And, and that's actually good. Because think about it. Architects design. They don't build. Sometimes you get architects that build and know how to do that, so they actually are better architects because they know how to build stuff. I would recommend everybody in the profession of architecture at some point in time actually going and working, whether it's a week or a summer, on a construction project and learning how to build something as opposed to just designing. At the same time, the, the, design, the builders, they know how to build, they don't know how to design. So this basically says here, hey, there's going to be times when the contractor will know how to build it better than the architect designed. They can build a better mousetrap than the architect designed that mousetrap. And if that happens, contractors are allowed to use that unless the architect has some big objection for it. 332. The contractor shall be responsible to the owner for the acts or omissions of the contractors, employees, subcontractors, agents, etc., etc. This is that kind of single point responsibility that I'm talking about. Owner enters into a contract with the contractor, and then under the contractor's umbrella are subs and vendors and tradesmen and materialmen and all the people that are below them. This provision says just that. I, contractor, am responsible for all the minions below me. And owner only looks to me. So, if the electrical system's failing, owner goes to the contractor, not the electrician. If there's a leaky roof, Owner goes to the contractor, not the roofer. If the driveway's cracking, owner goes to the contractor, not the concrete guy. That's what this provision says. 3, 4, labor and materials. Um, 3, 4, 1 just talks about that they're going to provide labor and materials to build. 3, 4, 2, except in the cases of minor changes in the work, the contractor may make substitutions only with the consent of the owner after evaluation by the architect and in accordance with the change order or construction change directive. So you're going to find, when you guys are out there, when you write specifications, sometimes you're going to say um, such and such type of, of paint or alternative or a substitution or equivalent. That's language that's often used in specifications. That can happen, but they still need, the contractor still needs to get consent by either a change order, and you see change orders capitalized, or constructive change directive. Those are in Article 7, so we're not going to get to those today, of, of what the definitions of they are. But they are specifically written orders talking about that there's going to be some modification from the drawings. And that could be as minor as where we're going to use, um, uh, instead of using Sherwin-Williams paint, we're going to use Dutch Boy. That's a substitution that may require a written approval. You know, the owner may say, well, I really want Sherman Williams or Benjamin Moore, you know. Um, 
Or it could be everything to saying, well, this trust is one and we're going to use a different trust. I had a piece of litigation, I think I told you guys about it, where the, the attic space and the interstitial space, have I told you guys about this, the mold that grew in the, the townhomes? So that was a, unfortunately for that, that was a, the owner was also the developer builder. So the architect specified a certain type of trust system. It was an open trust system that allowed air to flow through. The owner builder put in a box, a solid blue lamp trust that created three separate spaces that would have problems so there was no airflow. In that instance, this provision didn't really re didn't require the approval evaluation by the architect because the owner was the builder and they made their own approval. They went across the board. We had to argue why that wasn't valid, but, um, but by and large, you're going to have a situation where, or by, not by and large, in almost all those situations, contractor can't and shouldn't deviate from the drawings without a change order or constructive change directive, something in writing. 343. The contractor shall voice strict discipline and good order among the contractor's employees or other persons carrying work, uh, work on the job. No drinking, no, no, no drugs, uh, safety, can, uh, safety gut wear, um, they need to have safety talks, just to make sure that the project is safe and, and, and legal. A lot of times for larger projects, um, owners or contractors will have their own health and safety plans that's an attachment and becomes a contract document. And it shows all the obligations of how they have to work. Um, what they need to do. We, we had a, I had a project once um, where there was countless problems and uh, with a, we were the owner. Um, and in the course of discovery, we found a bunch of photographs. I don't know who took them, but it was in kind of a, 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 an upper level. It wasn't quite an attic space, but it was closed off. And it was just like, there was probably... 30 or 40 empty beer cans, and so that's where the guys would go up and they'd smoke dope and they'd, get, they'd drink and they'd do whatever they wanted, they'd all hide away, and probably only a few couple guys, but that was, that was really good discovery when I put the photograph down in front of the contractor's attorney and I'm like, there's a problem here. So, um, it, it didn't, it, we couldn't tie it to any problem or defect in the project, but it was not really the best evidence, so that helped us in our case and leverage, so. Okay, warranty. And this goes back to the best skill or anything else. 351, the contractor warrants to the owner and architect that the materials and equipment furnished under the contract will be of good quality and new unless the contract requirements require permit otherwise. You know, sometimes you want to have a distressed wood floor, so that's not going to be new. But this is basically saying what I get is I get a brand new shiny car. I get a brand new shiny house. I don't want you to be using doors from another project. Um, I happened to actually, my house uh, was built by a, a, a owner builder, or builder developer. Um, it was his house. He bought, I bought it from him. Um, he had some, got himself overextended when the market crashed in 08. And so we ended up buying his house. And my basement in my laundry room is blue slate stone tile. It's like really expensive. I guarantee you those were left over from other projects that he developed. He had, you know, so like, because they don't all match. It's like, a, it's a really expensive laundry room floor. It's a, it's a laundry room. So, it was probably new material, but he was taking it from other projects. And who knows what he did on the, I don't know why he, his business had issues and everything else. But what this contract says is you can't take something from another project that you have to have. It's got to be good quality or new unless the contract permits otherwise. So you don't want to borrow in Peter to pay Paul. Um, you will also say the work will conform to the requirements of the contract documents and will be free from defects, except for those inherent in the quality of the work and contract documents require a permit. So like, you know, after you nail in the drywall, sometimes there's going to be some nail pops, there's going to be little things here and there that's punchless. But basically, what you're saying, again, is I get a brand new shiny new house or a brand new shiny new building, whatever it is. That's what a warranty is. That's one of the major differences, again, between the standard of care that a contractor delivers. Best skill and labor, free from defects, warranty. Those are your guarantees that they must provide you. Architect never warrants their work. They do the best job possible or what an ordinary architect is going to be doing in that situation. So you guys have a different standard of care 
than a contractor does. It's a more stringent standard of care than what the architect carries, which is one of the reasons why contractors, by and large, or, or more often than not, big companies, make more money than architects, because they're carrying more risk. If I have to give you perfection, you got to pay me for that perfection. So, and that's a, that's a different financial discussion to be had, but that's what this is saying. In 351, three, you've got to give free from defects. Continue on. The, warrant, the contractor's warranty excludes remedy for damage or defects caused by abuse, alteration of the work not executed by the contractor, improper or insufficient maintenance, improper operation, or normal wear and tear and the normal usage. So, a warranty is like at the end of a project, you know, we warrant for about a year. That's a traditional, I think, and I make. Actually, it's in Article 12 of this that talks about how long the warranty. Normally, a standard warranty is one year. You can negotiate longer ones. A roof may have a 10 or 20 year warranty. Certain items have different ones. But your traditional construction warranty is one year. So during that period, what a warranty says is, if something is defective or broken, I'm the owner, and because it's a warranty and it's free from defects, all I have to do is call up the contractor and say, it's broken. Come fix it. I don't have to prove who did it wrong. I don't have to prove whether it was a design or a construction issue or anything. I just say, your work is not free from defects. Within that one year, contractor must replace it for free. Come in, fix it, whatever it is. And we've had, you know, everybody out here has probably bought a warranty for your your computer, warranties come with cars. It's kind of the same thing. You know, your alternator goes out in your car, if it's still in the warranty, you take it at the dealer, they replace it, they don't charge you. Same thing with construction, okay? The carve out here is, is this um, abuse or alterations to the work. So if you change something, you, the owner, modify it. Or if you're not maintaining it properly, let's say there's a pump or some other piece of equipment, do you have maintenance obligations? If you are the owner after the contractor's left, you don't maintain it, then the warranty is void. Um, or invalid. The damage or defect uh, caused by others or alterations, sometimes it happens during the course of a project. I represent a company that does um, roofing materials and uh, waterproofing. We installed, um, out in a federal courthouse out in Rockford, we installed a series of flat roof systems. And uh, when the project was finished, it had all these dips and dents and everything else because some other contractors were walking on it. So when, the, when, when they came to open the doors, the federal government came to my client and said, your roofs are all damaged, so we want you to honor your warranty and give us a new roof. And we went out and inspected it, and we could see like where it looked like footprints of people walking on our aluminum roof. And we're like, that's violated by this warranty. Now, my client also also does a ton of business with the federal government, so they knew that this was not something that they wanted to like, you know, get in a big fight with, so we actually came in and did work for them. Um, and, and at no cost to them, because that's good business. But legally, we didn't have to, because this provision excludes remedy for damage caused by others, defects or others. So that was the situation. So, 352. All material equipment or special warranties required by the contract shall be issued in the name of the owner or shall be transferable thereof. Meaning, when the contractor buys the pump or the dishwasher for your house, or what have you. The contractor's buying all that stuff. They're buying the wood, the steel, the, the blue slate stone tile, whatever it is. The manufacturer of, those, of that material or that equipment, whatever it is, is the party that's going to be providing the warranty ultimately. And that comes to the purchaser, which is the contractor. Well, that's not the owner. But the owner is the ultimate end purchaser. So what this provision does is it fills that gap. It says, I know you, contractor, paid for the roof. So the roofing manufacturer issued the warranty to you. I want you to either tell the roofing manufacturer to issue the warranty to me, or I want you to make sure that it can be transferred. If we remember, we talked about assignment in the first part of the semester. It can be assigned to me, Maybe be, me being the owner. So that's what this provision is. Making sure that the warranties don't get lost and that the owner finds himself with no remedy because the warranty is being held by the contractor. 3.7. Permits, fees, notices, and compliance with laws. So unless otherwise provided, the contractor shall secure and pay for building permits 
as well as other permits, fees, and for inspections by government agencies necessary for the proper execution and completion of the work. So this is a little different. If you remember up in Article 2, it talks about the owner needs to pay for the surveys and if there's going to be any geotech inspections and all those things that the owner has to pay for. Here, it says the contractor has to pay for the building permits and those things that are relevant or similar to the building permit, whatever the governmental agencies are. The reason why they do that, actually, is because ultimately, even though the contractor's paying for the building permit, the contractor's going to pass that bill on to the owner. But technically, the building permit needs to be issued for the contractor because they're the builder. So the owner's going to be a named party on that building permit because it's going to be the ultimate of their project. But that's why you have the contractor pay for it. The timing, the circumstances, the contractor's going to push that cost downstream but for logistical purposes, contractors obligated to pay, to secure and pay for the building permits. 372, contractors should comply and give notices required by applicable laws, statutes, ordinance, codes, rules, regulations, etc. So for this, this is, um, I'll give you an example there. So we, one of my clients um, is building a, an apartment building uh, here in Chicago, downtown Chicago. And, um, there's going to be curb cuts. Well, when you're, there's already a curb, that's, there's a sidewalk and a curb that the city's already poured. Well, they're going to need to cut a curb because there's going to be a rampway to go into the driveway for the garage. They need to notify the city they're going to do that because they're going ahead and cutting on city property. Um, the property that we own doesn't include the CERB. So that's the, but the contractor knows when they're going to do that. Or they have to notify the next door neighbors of when things are going to happen. We're going to start driving piles and making noises and all these other things. So there are, there are elements or things that happen in construction that have to happen, but the contractor is responsible for the schedule, the contractor is responsible for doing the work. They know when they're doing the curb cut. They know when they're going to be doing the piles. So it just makes sense that you have this provision in here that says, hey, you know what you're doing. You're the one that should be telling the city about it. We're not going to interfere with you, but that's your job, not mine. I'm just the dumb owner that writes the check. I just want the pretty building when it's done. Again, sometimes owners are very sophisticated and they know a lot more, but let's leave the, the, the responsibility of construction and communicating with the, the world at large and the city and everything else to the contractors to do it, because that's what their job is. 373. If the contractor performs the work knowing it to be contrary to applicable laws, etc., 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 the contractor shall assume appropriate responsibility for such work and should be bear, uh, bear the cost attributed with such correction. So if they fail to notify the city of the curb cut that they're going to be doing, and they make the curb cut and the city comes back and issues a fine, the fine is going to come to the owner. This provision says I can pass it to the contractor. If you knew there was a law, and 372 says, you've got to figure out what those laws are that you've got to give notice to the city of. So by having 32, they should know that law. So 373 is if you failed, and if you violated that law and it causes a cost to me, the owner, you're going to pay for it. So, so you have to have people that are working when you have a contract. You've got to have the people that know what the city requirements are. You've got to work closely with them. It's not just, let's just go and build and owner took care of that, and the architect put the pretty designs, and we're just going to go ahead and build. Contractor has obligations. They have to work and interface with the city. Concealed or unknown conditions. 374. If the contractor encounters conditions of the site that are subsurface, underground, or otherwise concealed, um, or unknown physical conditions of an unusual nature that differ materially from the ordinarily found to exist, blah, 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 the contractor shall promptly provide notice to the owner and the architect before the conditions are disturbed, and in no event, no later than 14 days after the first observ observ observance of the conditions. So, one of those obligations of the owner is to provide surveys, and what the, the utility conditions are. So the owner's going to go out and they're going to call. There's a, the service in Illinois is called Julie. So like this summer, we, my, my son and I had a project. We built uh, a little like six by eight pond. 
and we built a little rock waterfall in the corner of it. That was his summer project with me. And I was actually pretty proud of the 10-year-old because we, it, when we were all done with it, we had 2,400 pounds of rock. We went to this place, we load up my car, and we drive it back, and we go and load it up, drive it back. And every time we got in the driveway, my son took all the rocks out of the car with the wheelbarrow and over a period of like three days moved all 2,400 pounds of the rock. I, was, I couldn't believe my 10-year-old. It was great because I just watched. But in any event, we had to have um, uh, the, uh, the, we'd have electrical run out to where the pump is. And so I called an electrical contractor, and he's like, have you had Julie come out? And Julie works, it's a, I can't remember what the adjective stands for, but um, it's basically having all the various organizations. And so ComEd and Comcast and the, uh, the gas company came out. They all came out, and they have their little, everybody has their own color paint and the little flag. And they came in and marked where all the lines were, so when the guy was cutting the, the trough for the electrical uh, conduit to go out to the, the plug for the pump, we would know where everything would go. That's what the owner has to do, and that's what they provide here. So, um, but if it turned out that my electrician, when he was installing that conduit for the, for the plug that we ran out there, if that electrician had found something different than what had been the information provided to him by me and Julie, that's what this thing, if they, can, if they encounter conditions in site that are subsurface or differ from materially from what normally is found, they need to provide notice to the owner. So he would have come to me and said, hey, by the way, there's a huge tank here or whatever it might be. Um, and then they stop working. The contractor stops working until the condition is fixed. So that's what, that's what their obligation is under here. If there's an unknown or concealed condition that you couldn't tell once it's discovered, raise your hand and tell the owner what's it. Um, then it continues on and says, if the architect shall, um, blah, 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 no change, so can, uh, the for the Okay, sometimes there, and this talks about it, there's a be, if there's a change in cost, there'll be an equitable adjustment to the contract so there's, they can get more time and money. Um, there's sometimes where the architect may disagree, and if there's a disagreement with, between what the contractor says of this concealed and unknown condition, or the architect says, well, you should have known that it was behind there, or whatever it might be, then there can be a claim. That's what the last part here says. You can make a claim under Article 15. Any questions on that? Um, 375. In the course of the world, contract encounters human remains or recognizes the existence of burial markers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The contractor shall immediately suspend any operations that would affect them and shall notify the owner and the architect. So. This, I, I did not have this come up. I have not come this come up personally, but I represent a client who did have this. When they were building McCormick Place, the one, um, the lakeside, the, the, the original building right on the lake, when they were digging the foundations for that, they found Indian burial grounds underneath that. They had to stop. And then you got to come in and you have to investigate what it was for. At the time, they just found remains. They didn't know it was an Indian burial ground. But then they brought into the, they brought the tribes in and they were able to figure out what to do with it. Um, there was a show on the air for many, many years, CSI, um, and there was one episode where they were, uh, they were putting in a new casino and they found the burial remains of a woman, um, and uh, I can't remember the name of the character on the show, but he was a kind of a 50s gangster Vegas aficionado, that was his, he loved the history of Vegas, and he was able to tie this woman's remains on the show to a cold case of this woman that had been killed back from the mobs in the 50s, and, but they had to shut down the construction project because of a provision like this. So if you find something, shut it down and make sure the owner knows about it. That's effectively what these two provisions are saying. 3.8, allowances. So allowances as a general thing, here's what an allowance is. When I'm bidding a project, the contractor gets the drawings in, and there may be things that the owner has not made a final decision. I know I want this to be a brick-clad house, but I don't know if I want dark red brick, medium red brick, or kind of that mottled whitish red brick. I'm not sure of the type of brick I want, but I know I want a brick house. Well, those bricks may be a little bit different in cost between one or the other, but the contractor needs to bid it. So they're going to take a look at it and they're going to say, okay, there's this many square foot of brick on the house. I can't price it because I don't know which brick it's going to be, so I'm going to create a category of an allowance of a dollar figure. And I'm going to say the brick cladding of your house will be $100,000. That's a generalized figure 
of which is an allowance. I am allowing in my bid for your $2 million house 100000 of that for brick. If it comes less than 100000 you pay the, least, the lower amount. If it's more than 100000 you pay the higher amount. You pay whatever it costs, but I have to put a placeholder in there. Now, the, the biggest area comes in in residential is like kitchen appliances. Well, is it going to be black or stainless or is it going to be Whirlpool or Frigidaire or whatever it is? So they do an allowance for appliances. It's a set amount. $18,000 for appliances. So you're going to be plus or minus. So that's what allowance is here. They shall include in the contract sum all allowances stated in the contract documents. You have to have that placeholder to make sure the bid is accurate. You can't just say, well, I know you want brick cladding, but since you didn't tell me the type of brick, I'm not going to put a figure in. You've got to put something in here. Okay? And then it goes on. Unless otherwise provided, the allowance shall cover the cost of the contractor, materials, and equipment to be delivered to the site and include all taxes, blah, blah, blah. Contractor's cost for loading and loading. Whenever the cost are more or less than the allowance, the contract sum shall be adjusted accordingly by change order. So, let's use my example of the brick in the $2 million house. Build the house for you for $2 million. My allowance includes is 100000 in brick. When we go find and you finally pick the brick out, and it costs me $150,000 for that brick, the house will have, the, the price for the project will have a change order, and the price will go from $2 million to $2,050,000. All this is doing is saying we're putting in a placeholder here, and when you owner figure out exactly what you want, we add or subtract those dollars. Got to let you know that your price is going to change one way or the other. Most of the time it goes up. Just because that's the way things are. Any questions on allowances? Allowances are used all the time. You're going to have every, almost every project you're ever going to use, do will have allowances. Because you're never going to do 100% type of drawings. Your owner's never going to be able to make all the decisions before it goes up the bid. So there's just, sometimes there's just chunks of allowances. 3-9, superintendent. Contractor is going to employ a competent superintendent, and they shall represent the contractor, and communications given to the superintendent shall be by, as binding as this given to the contractor. So, the contractor will designate an owner's, their own representative, kind of like in Article 2, says owner got designated a representative, contractor will do that as well. And that includes, more often than that, will be a project manager, the senior person that maybe is not on the site every day. The super is on the site every single day. And so what this contract says is, whether you have designated somebody else as your project representative, any communications through the superintendent are also binding. So it's basically saying you have, are going to have at least, you may have two. I can give my notice to the owner, to the project manager, or I can give it to the super. It's the same thing. That's what this says. Um, contractor 392 shall notify the owner, the architect, the proposed. Oh, so this is the, you got to give the information of the of the superintendent. You have to within 14 days of the contract being signed. Um, and then if there's going to be a change in the position, so you, you, maybe the superintendent um, didn't work out for the company. Maybe they, the superintendent moved to a different state. Whatever it is, if there's some change. Um, the architect, the owner has to, the contractor has to provide notice to the owner of that um, and or the architect. So, 393, three, contractor shall not employ a proposed superintendent to the owner has made a reasonable and timely objective, objection. So sometimes you're on a project, this is, this is, a, this is a good provision to project, protect um, the owner in the sense of so I go out to bid, I interview four or five contractors, and I meet the team of the contractor I end up hiring. I really like the project manager, I like the superintendent, they have really good skills, they, they're, they're kind of a salty old vet in the, in the field, been building buildings for decades. And the projects move along, everything's going smoothly, and then the contractor has a new project for somebody else. And they want to take the super off of my project and put them on the new project because it's a shinier, better project, more money, whatever it might be. We can't let the contractor... I hired this contractor because that was their team. I want the A team. You can't just start cherry-picking people off my A team because you have another project. 
Now, they can do that, and then they, sometimes they can come back and say, well, okay, we're not going to have... We're not going to have Sarah doing this anymore. She's going to go on another project. But we're bringing in, um, bringing in Beth. Beth really knows his stuff. And so this says, um, if they have to make a reasonable and timely objective. Our objection to Beth, objection to Beth has to be reasonable and timely. If it's not, then Beth can come in and run the project. But it's trying to make sure that the contractor doesn't take their best te- people off the team because that's who you hired. You know? I brought in the A-team, I hired the A-team, I want the A-team through the end. 310. Contractors' construction and submittal schedules. After the contract is award, they shall submit the owner and the architect information, their construction schedule for the work. This is how long it's going to take, this is when we're going to do excavation, concrete, steel, carpentry, whatever it is. That's the project schedule. And it shall consu- include detail appropriate to the work, including date of commencement, in terms of schedule milestone dates, date of substantial completion, um, portion of the work for construction activity, and the time required for completion each portion. So you're going to see this schedule that has these little pieces of when things are going to start and stop and durations and everything else. Um, that is the project schedule is probably the most important document on any construction project. Not, not the same thing against architects, because I know I'm teaching a bunch of architects here, but it is actually more important than the plans and specifications. I know you can't build the project without a set of plans and specs, but the schedule is the most important because it drives cost. And if a contractor gets off schedule, the project is going to cost more. If the contractor can stay on schedule, you get the project in on time and on budget. Everybody's happy. You know, if we go back to the example I've used in the past, um, I need to get my toy factory up and running by September 1st so I can be able to make sales for the Christmas season. That's driven by the schedule. And so that's what's the most important thing and how detailed the project schedule is identified in here. My provisions, what I take in this, is I have additional provisions that I add to this that actually ask for more detail, more breakdown of how it's laid out. But not every project demands that specificity, so the AIA kind of has a more generalized term. Just so you know, the 1, 2, and 3 here is in more detail than the previous version, so they actually have started to create some more specificity, but, but I go further on that, because the schedule is so important to my project. 310.2. The contractor shall promptly, after being awarded the contract, or thereafter necessary to maintain current submittal schedule, so submit a submittal schedule for the architect's approval. So there's the project schedule of when everything's going to be built. There's a submittal schedule. What a submittal schedule is, if we go back to my example for the brick, or maybe the type of concrete, or what have you, the architect's going to have a specification. You need to use this type of concrete. It has to have certain mix, and it's slump and slurry. We want to use this type of brick. Well, the architect wants to see that the contractor's following those plans and specs so they must submit samples. Here are the three bricks that we believe satisfy your specification architect. Tell me which of those three you want to use. It's a submittal. Here are examples of paint chips. Tell me which paint you want to use. So the contractor, and it's not just simply, you know, aesthetic things. There's, there's a whole bunch of things that come into submittal schedules. Um, so the contractor, in addition to creating a project schedule of when work is going to be fit, started and finished, it's going to also do a submittal schedule that says, I'm going to give you this sample, and architect, you must tell me which one to use, and it's the back and forth. So it's a different type of schedule, but also critically important. If the submittals aren't approved by the architect or the owner, that will impact. When the bricklayer wants to come in and lay the brick, If the submittals haven't been approved or they weren't submitted early enough, then we don't know which of the three to use. We don't know which ones to order. When we finally do order, if they come late, the bricklayer was supposed to start on May 1st. Maybe they don't start till May 17th. Now you have a 17-day delay in the project that may impact other work. So submittal schedules are just as important as the project schedule of when things are being submitted for review and approval. Um, needs to be coordinated with the contractor's construction schedule. That makes sense. Kind of, it's a, it's a lead into. 
um, and allow the architect reasonable time to review the submittals. So you can't just give them an architect and say, here are the three bricks we think that match. Tell me by today which ones I go out and order, because if not, it's going to be late. You've got to give everybody reasonable time. Traditionally, in the construction industry, seven to ten days for review of submittals, review and respond. So you, as the architects out there, you're going to be getting the submittals. You need to respond to them timely as well. Um, the contractor fails to submit a submittal schedule, fails to provide the schedule, submittals in accordance with those submittal schedules, the contractor shall not be entitled to any increase of contract sum or contract time. So if they don't follow their own schedule, they don't get time or money for that. 311. Okay. Contracts should be available at the project site. Contract documents change orders, construction change directives, modifications, etc., etc. So uh, shop drawings, product data. This is just basically saying on the project site, the contractor has to have available a complete set of the drawings and documents, the plans and specifications from which it is working to build the project. It can't be at the home office. We have to know that what's in the field is the most current, complete set of up-to-date drawings. So when the architect's out there, they can roll open the plans and they can say, here's what should have been built, and I know these are the most current and up-to-date set of plans and specs. That's what 311 is saying. On site, not somewhere else. So the question is, how did the architect keep the contract up to date with the construction documents? So what happens is, um, there's a series of, of, of designated types of documents that are passed back and forth. So in the beginning, the architect gives the contractor a set of plans and specifications. They may be transmitted digitally or they may be transmitted, transmitted by, actually, here's your physical printed out set of, of blue line drawings. Um, and those are in the field. They may be electronically on the computer, but most of the time the contractors are going to roll them out on paper because they're going to be taking them and the steel guy's going to have them up where they're doing their bolting or whatever it might be. Then, as the contractor works along, maybe something happens that they, the drawings, because you're never going to provide a 100% complete set of drawings, the contractor's going to have some question and need some clarification. I think I know how you want this built. But I'm not sure, so I'm going to issue what's called a request for information, an RFI. The RFI is in writing, and it's going to say, on page A32, that's the architectural, page 32 of the architecturals, or, or E21, that's page 21 of the electrical drawings. They all have their own little initial before that. I have a question about this section, and how the connections, and how this drawing, and how this is supposed to be built. Please file for clarification. That will be in a written document, probably sent by, attached to an email, or maybe you have a project website. But that'll be like on an eight and a half by 11 page, asking for clarification. The architect's gonna go back and they're gonna open up the drawings, they're gonna go to page A32, and they're gonna look at that area and that detail where the RFI, request for information, is asking for something. And the architect will do the following. They will either issue a written eight and a half by 11 piece of paper response and say, here's the clarification, and that's how they transmit the communication, or, then they have that and say, see the attached revised drawing. That revised drawing in the area where that change was made from that little section, where the specific changes will have a series, it looks like a bubble. They call it bubbling up of the drawings. And you will actually be able to see if anything on the drawings has been bubbled, you know that that has been a change. And so the contractor then will receive that drawing back and they will take out A32, and they will put in the new A32 with the bubbled up area. And so when the architect visits the project site three weeks later and goes to the area where the detail is, they will check to make sure that the bubbled up drawing is in the set and that it was built in accordance with the change to the bubbled up drawing. That's how the communication works. That's a, a, a one example of how it would be. Does that answer your question? Good, okay. All right, 312, shop drawings. Product data and samples. These are all part of the submittals. So, shop drawings, capital FD, so it's a defined term, are drawings, diagrams, schedules, and other data specifically prepared for the work by the contractor or the subcontractor or sub subcontractors. It is not prepared by the architect. That's the bolt diagram layout. That's the coordination of where the condo is going to run for the electrical. 
shop drawings are done by the contractor side. And it's to illustrate some portion of the work. Product data is scheduled, performance, brochures, and otherwise. Samples, here's your three types of bricks. So these are just types of things that when the contractor takes the play of the specs, they prepare or gather these types of information, shop drawings, product data, and sample. And that information is then submitted in accordance with the submittal schedule to the architect for review and confirmation. So it talks about here. Shop drawings, product data, samples, and similar are not contract documents. So that bolt diagram is not a contract document. It is not something that everybody is obligated to perform to. It's relevant to how the project is built, but it's not a contract document. Specifically because a lot of times shop drawing is done by the subcontractor, not the contractor. So how could it be a contract document between an owner and contractor when it's done by a third party? The purpose is to demonstrate how the contractor proposes to conform the information given by the design concept, by the architect, for those portions of the work for which the contract documents require submittals. Review by the architect is subject to the limitations of 427. We'll get there in a little bit. Submittals that are not required by the contract documents may be returned by the architect without action. So sometimes the contractor is going to say, here's a submittal, here's a submittal, approve, approve, approve. And if the, if the contractor, if the architect doesn't need to approve it, they'll just return it. They don't have to approve everything. But this says, I, contractor, am going to give you architect submittals, but they don't rise to the level of a contract document. They don't put anybody to have an obligation one way or the other. Again, they're relevant if something goes wrong, but they are not a contract between owner and contractor. 312.5. The contractor shall review for compliance with the contract documents, approve, and submit to the architect's uh, the shop drawings, product data, samples, and submitter submittals required by the contract documents. With, and the architect needs to return them with reasonable promptness and in such sequences to cause no delay to the work. So the architect's going to review them, certainly. And there's shop drawings as discussed in the B101. But the contractor also needs to review and approve them. So if you think about it again, that umbrella, contractor sits on top and it's got all the different subs below. When the electrician does its electrical shop drawings, they're going to provide it to the contractor who will in turn give it to the owner. The contractor can't just blindly pass it through. They own the responsibility of making sure that what the sub did is proper. And that's what this provision says. You can't just say I'm a pass-through. In fact, you actually own responsibility of what's in those submittals. So by submitting it, 312.6, the contractor is representing to the owner and the architect that they have reviewed and approved them. That they've determined and verified the materials, field measurements, field construction, etc. And they have checked and coordinated the information contained within such submittals. Again, this is reaffirming what says up above in 312.6, contractor owns them. If something goes wrong and everybody relied on these shop drawing samples and submittals, contractor has a responsibility. Now, it can pass its downstream to the sub. They can take its liability. But the owner, the reason why you need this is for the owner to make sure the owner doesn't have to sue the subcontractor. The owner goes after the contractor. Your shop drawings, I don't care who prepared them, they're yours. They failed. I'm going to sue you on those. Okay? 312.7. The contractor shall perform no portion of the work for which the contract documents require submittal until the respective submittal has been approved by the architect. So, take my brick example. Contractor says on the submittal schedule, here are my three bricks. Tell me, architect, which one to use. They can't go and just pick one and start building because they want to without the approval of the owner or the architect. If they weren't told which of the three to use, they can't build it. If they do, the contractor runs the risk. Now, the contractor may have a claim back and said, yeah, but you didn't return the response for a month. I was respecting, expecting it in seven to ten days. So I was in this position. And the owner comes back to the contract and says, you should have written a letter. You should have given me a claim letter that we were outside of the schedule. So there's this, there'll be this finger pointing of who didn't do what. You didn't tell me. You didn't approve. You should have done this. And there's all that. And that's when you call me to figure out whose finger pointing is better. So... 
12 uh, Work shall be in accordance with the proof submittals, except for that the contractor shall not be re- relieved of responsibility for deviations from the requirements of the contract documents by the architect's approval. This is kind of an interesting one. So I get those bolt diagrams and the bolt connections for my column and beam scenario as the architect. They're submitted to me. I look them over. They look fine. I've done enough of these buildings that it seems that if the the four-point bolt diagram of where they're going to bolt this column to the concrete pad and the five-point diagram that they have up above, they appear to be correct. If you remember from the B101 in my discussion, the architect, so I approve it. I say, yeah, it looks good. I approve. Move forward. But the architect is not required to check the subcontractor's math on a shop drawing. If it turns out that the, draw, the, the drawing of the four bolts on that pad of how that column was going to be anchored should have been five, or the five bolts that were between the column and beam, they were fine, but the size of the bolt was too small, and so they sheared off and caused a catastrophic failure in either instance, simply because the, con- the architect approved the shop drawings does not mean that the architect is responsible that the bolts were too small and there was the shearing. In fact, it's the contractor's obligation to make sure that the subcontractor did its job. So there's this kind of, this push-pull of who carries the responsibility. And that's, that's this is an actual case. There was the, um, the uh, this is many years ago, but there was a tragic, uh, four, I think three or four people died when they were doing the, um, uh, the post office here. There was a construction accident with the post office and it had to do with the, the way the, the, the bolts were in the connection and sheared and failed. There was also a failure out for the same reason that the bolt diagrams were improper with um, out at uh, Rosemont. There was a failure in the trust systems and, and, and hundreds or millions of dollars in that that were lost. I don't know if any were lost of life, uh, loss of life in Rosemont or not. But that was because the shop drawings were not proper. And the architect could have had some responsibility but the owner, the, the, the attorney for the architect actually was very aggressive and got themselves out of the case almost immediately. Um, but in that instance, the contractor was always on the hook because it says the contract shall not be relieved of responsibility for deviations of the requirements of documents by the architect's approval. Simply because the architect approved them doesn't mean the contractor doesn't have liability still. Okay? Um, unless, unless, the contractor specifically notified the architect that there was a deviation when they gave the submittal. Here, here are the shop drawings for my, my, my steel erector. I think there's problems with them, but go ahead and review them. Tell me if they're okay. I'm fighting it out with my steel erector, but I have a problem. So they notified the architect of the deviation. That may get the contractor out of the, out of the problem. Um, and if the architect has given written approval, Okay, contractor, we see you think there's some problems with this bolt diagram and the bolt connections. We've checked it. It's going to be okay. So it removes or gives insulation to the contractor. Or a change order or construction change directive has been issued authorizing deviations. So depending on how it's in writing. That's how the contractor can, can say, I'm not responsible because I've passed that responsibility on to someone else. Any questions on that? 312.9. Um, oh, if there are revisions required in the absence of such notice, the architect's approval of the resubmission shall not apply to such revisions. So, depending on sequencing and timing, I wouldn't worry too much about this at this point. 312.10. The contractor shall not be required to provide professional services that constitute the practice of architecture or engineering unless specifically required by the contract document. So this is the contractor's, like for the architect, you're not responsible for means, methods, materials, sequences, procedures, and safety. This is the, archi- this is the contractor side of it. I'm not responsible to be an architect or an engineer. Unless there's a specific place in the contract documents that requires me. Traditionally, that's going to be um, curtain wall systems, fire protection, shoring and bracing. There are some things that automatically fall to the contractor. The architect never designs them. But by and large, because of this provision, contractor could say, I have no idea about design, engineering, or architecture. That's your problem, architect. So, um, and then it says, if you need to provide such services, the contractor needs to um, uh, make sure that they're also responsible for means, methods, techniques, sequence, and procedures. 
so. 31011. Um, let's see. Oh, so this says if there's something that requires some type of certification or other thing that the architect is, you know, I, architect, am certifying these drawings, if it requires some compliance with the laws, um, the owner and architect will specify those design criteria and certifications, and the contractor is entitled to rely on the accuracy of what the architect is saying. So, you gave me drawings, you say you're certified for the specific detail, I'm allowed as the contractor to rely on your certification. You're the professional, I'm just the builder. Uh, 3 till 10 continued. The owner of the architect shall be entitled to rely on the adequacy of the services. Oh, so this is basically saying the opposite for this, with respect to if shop drawings are provided, then the owner and the architect are, rely, are allowed to rely on the accuracy of what the contractor is providing or its subcontractors with respect to shop drawings or other types of submittals. So the primary design is the architect, contractor relies on the architect. Shop drawings and other small details, architect and owner relied to, allowed to rely on the contractor. So, you know, the, the, the balance, the, the yin yang of it. Um, 312.10.2, if the contract documents require the contractor's design professional, so let's say this fire protection company, to certify the work has been performed in accordance with the design criteria, they need to furnish that certification. So you're going to find for the fire protection system in this building somewhere whether it's a piece of paper or on a wall or a plaque or someone else, a certification by the fire protection system company that designed the system. It's not going to be by the architect. It's going to be by the contractor or the subcontractor that the general contractor hired. Um, these two provisions, use of site, you're just going to make sure that the site is in good materials and following code. Cutting and patching, that's just talking about if you have to cut and repatch stuff, uh, just basic stuff in the provisions. Cleaning up, 315, make sure that the contractor keeps the project broom clean, um, and, and at the end they turn it over, there's not garbage and beer and whatever else that we saw in the photographs of my project. Um, 316, access to the work. Owner and the architect are allowed to walk the project site. Um, I have a, a, a very interesting local, so the guy, I told you that I bought my house from a, a builder developer, um, and it was his house. At the same time as he was building his, he was building one across the street. Um, and my neighbor, my current neighbor, who now lives in that house, at the time was just an investor in that house and um, was not going to live in it. He lived a couple blocks away, was happy with his house. But at some point in time, my neighbor decided, well, I really like this new house that I'm investing in. I'm just going to buy it all outright and, and move in. My, the builder, who was the former owner of my house, never let my neighbor in the house before it was finished. Never let him walk the project site. Even though he was an investor and it was going to buy it and build it. Or he bought it and was, and was going to live in it. So it was going to be his house. And the builder never let him in. I didn't know this for many years, but we had some problems with our house. There was some water issues and some other stuff because the, the contractor took some shortcuts. And so I was talking to my neighbor and I said, did you ever have these issues? And he had some of the same problems as I did where the same trades were poor. And, and he then confided in me that there was many other problems with his house and that he never was able to go on the project site ever, which was awful. Like, I would have gone ballistic. If I'm going to be spending as much money as to buy a brand new five-bedroom house, I sure as hell want to see it when I'm being, when it's under construction. That's what that says. 316 says the owner has access to the site. They can come and see whatever they want. So... Royalties, patents, and copyrights. What 317 basically says is sometimes if there is anything that the contractor must do that requires the contractor to pay some type of royalty or license for intellectual property, not the drawings on which it's building, but something else, the contractor is responsible for paying that. If they violate somebody's intellectual property rights, the contractor is obligated for those violations. So here's a perfect example where that comes in. Um, as I said, I build back and I, I work on power plants. And for coal-fired power plants, um, obviously the coal, the smoke comes out from the burning coal is dirty and you have to clean it. That's what clean coal is. It's, clean coal isn't really just some new kind of coal that's actually cleaner. It's actually you're cleaning the smoke that's coming out. And there's certain technologies that are used, both chemical and physical technologies, to remove the sulfurs and the, the, the NOx and the mercury and everything else 
from that smoke emissions so that the, the smoke that's coming out of the smokestack when you drive by a coal-fired power plant is actually largely water vapor when it's already done, when it's all said and done. The technology of building these systems are designed and developed by certain companies that will be installing their systems. But they're not the contractor. They may build and design and build their own systems, but they're a subcontractor. So what ends up happening is, is the owner hires a big contractor like Bechtel. And Bechtel is going to build this back end of the power plant. Bechtel then hires specialty subcontractor for the chemical process to clean the smoke. Bechtel must pay a license or a royalty to that company. And then Bechtel will charge that and pass that along to us because Bechtel's taking their technology and putting it into the project they're building for us because it's a design-build type structure. So that's what this is talking about. And that they can't infringe here. If Bechtel doesn't pay that entity or if Bechtel's using some other's intellectual property in their construction of my project and I get sued because it's got somebody else's intellectual property in it, 317 says that's Bechtel's problem. The contractor needed to take care of getting the licenses, paying the royalties, what have you. So, 318, indemnification. I'm going to go over indemnification. We, we talked about indemnification earlier on when we were doing insurance. So I'm just going to kind of go over this really quickly. Number one, I don't think the, the provisions in this, in this the 318, 1, 2, and 3 are okay. They are not great as far as I'm concerned as an indemnification provision, but they're okay. They, they, they're, they're satisfied. The reason why they're just okay is because every state handles indemnity just a little bit differently. So the AIA does its best to kind of give a generic indemnity provision. If you are ever going to be in a contract and negotiating, talk to a lawyer about what your indemnity should be. So I won't go through the details. I will not be asking you an indemnity question on the, on the exam. But what I want to tell you is a little bit about it is what indemnity does and what this provision is saying. So the contractor shall hold, indemnify, and hold harmless the only architect, its consultant, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from claims, damages, losses, and expenses, including by the limit to blah, 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 for any bodily injury, sickness, disease, death, or injury to destruction of property, but only to the extent caused by the negligent actual omissions of the contractor or anyone else directly employed by him. What does that all mean? Like that, this is the most legalese part of this contract, is this provision. So here's what it means. Indemnity comes in when there is a third party that has an injury. So we have owner and contractor. They are together by that line. They are first parties. If I have a claim against the contractor, it's a first party claim. If the contractor has a claim against me, it's a first party claim. Indemnity comes in when there's a third party. The guy walking on the project site that gets injured. The next door neighbor whose property gets damaged. Something to that effect. It's not the first party. So this provision only comes into play when there's a third party. Maybe the federal government is fining because that smoke coming out of the factory is not meeting the, clear, the clean admission standards. So the owner gets fined. There's a third party loss or damage. So it could be a bodily injury. Walk along the project site, I fall, I break my leg. That's a bodily injury. Could be a fine by the federal government. Could be a fire started and impacts the next door neighbor's property. All of those third parties will bring a lawsuit against me, the owner. And they are claiming the damage, loss, or expenses. If that third party, it's not the damage, loss, or expense, the contractor, it's the third party's damage, loss, or expense. If I am sued by that third party, I, the owner, and it's caused by the negligent acts or omissions of the contractor or its subcontractor, if the reason why the guy fell in the hole is because the contractor dug it and didn't put a barricade around it, it's not my fault, it's the contractor's fault. But the person who's injured doesn't know who the contractor is and only sues me. I take this provision and I turn to the contractor and I say, you must indemnify me for that person's loss because it was caused by you. I'm the only one being sued, but you need to step in under this clause and indemnify me. That's what indemnification is. That's what this is saying. 
third party sues something. And indemnification often can go either way. There may be times when the owner must indemnify the contractor. But mostly it's the contractor, because it's the contractor's work, and it's coming out of the contractor's work. Most of the time the injury is caused by the contractor's failure, the loss, the damage, whatever it might be. And the owner is looking for the contractor to pick up its fair share, I guess is the best way to put it. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, this is a little bit more on indemnification. It talks about limitations of what the type is. And then that's it. That's the rest of it for Article 3. That's the contractor. Okay. We have about a half hour, so we're going to get through the rest of the architect and a little bit of subcontractor will be finished. Okay? Architect. A lot of this you're going to see was from the B101. All right. Um, duties, responsibilities, limitations to the authority. It's limited, and it shall not be restricted, modified, or extended without written cause confirmation. So basically, this is just saying the architect's responsibilities are very limited, and it's only found in this provision. And if you remember, this document is not a contract between the owner and the architect. What this document is is the contract, but it's going to tell the contractor owner gave the architect authority to act in these certain ways. So we'll go through what the architect is going to do. And the architect has to be involved. They have to do part of the communication. So that's what we're going to do in here. So, administration of the contract. When you guys are out there in the construction, you're going to be administrating. So you're going to provide administration of the contract. You're going to be the owner's representative until the architect issues the final certificate of payment. The architect will have the authority to act on the behalf of the owner only to the extent provided in the contract document. Same provision in the B101. It must say you are acting with the authority. Otherwise, you're just, the architect's just on the project site kind of helping out, but not locking or binding the owner into the statement. 422. Architects got to visit the site at appropriate intervals to become, um, to become generally familiar with the project. This is the exact same language that's in the BU 101. Generally familiar with the quality of work. Um, making sure that what's fully completed will be in accordance with the intent of the contract documents. They're not required to do the on-site continuous inspections. This language, you saw the exact same language in the B101. So that's just saying to the contractor, here's what the architect has already agreed with the owner. That's what the architect is doing here. So very familiar with that. 423, based on their site visits, the owner shall keep the, or the architect will keep the owner reasonably informed of the progress and quality of the work, known deviations, um, known deviations from the most recent construction schedule, and defects and deficiencies observed in the work. Exact same language from the B101 here, so you know what the architect is going to do. Um, the architect shall not have control over and not be responsible for actual omission of the contractor, so we're not responsible for whatever the contractors are doing. So it's, it's not, again, it doesn't create a contract between the owner and the contractor, but it lets the contractor know what the deal is between the owner and the architect. 424, the owner and the contractor shall include the architect in all communications that relate or reflect to the architect's services. And the architect, the owner shall promptly notify the architect of any substance or direct communications between the owner and the contractor otherwise relating to the project. This language is brand new in the 2017. It was not in the 2007. So the, the way communication happened for decades was contractor talked to the architect about everything, whether it was through RFIs or project in the field and everything else. And then the architect would translate and relay that information to the owner. The owner would make a decision and it would go back to the architect and to the contractor. So everything flowed through the architect forward and backwards. All the communication went through that way. Two problems have occurred over the years from that. Number one, contractors always talking to the architect, and, but it says in two other provisions previous, the architect doesn't have authority except what we're specifically saying. So the contractor was always finding like, God, I just want to talk to the owner. I want to get the approval from the guy that gave me authority. Why should I keep going through the middleman? So there was problems and litigation would ensue because there would be questions whether the architect was getting out too far over its authority, over its, you know, doing what they shouldn't do. So that was one way that the reasons why the contractor and the architect didn't like being found in the middle sometimes, where the owner's like, I thought you approved it. Well, I'm not allowed to prove it. You have to, all that stuff. 
So that was one reason to change that. The other reason why is because owners have become much more sophisticated and actively involved. And so what would happen is the owner's walking on the project site and they tell the contractor, move this wall. And then the architect shows up three weeks later and says to the contractor, your wall's in the wrong spot. You're not in accordance with the contract documents. And the contractor's like, well, the owner told me to do that. And then the architect's like, well, I didn't know about it. And so there's this communication gap because the owners were not following the proper chain of command. So the AIA recognized that and they said, well, what we're going to do now is anytime the owner talks to the, architect, the, the, the contractor directly, they must notify the owner or the architect. They must notify the architect. So it's putting an obligation on the architect or the owner to inform the architect to keep them in the loop. Um, and same with the contractor. So when they're going back and forth, if, if, if the old system of telephone from contractor, architect, and owner, to architect, to contractor, if that old system is being subverted, this provision says whoever is deciding to go out around the middleman needs to keep the middleman in the loop. Okay? Further on, communications buying with subcontractors and suppliers shall be through the contractor. Communications buying with the separate contractors shall be through the owner. So this is another new provision. It says, hey, owner, you are not allowed to talk to my subcontractors. You must, you shall, you have to go through me. Contractor, you're not allowed to talk to my specialty kitchen designer. You must, you shall, you have to go through the owner. Making it very clear. So that one, you have to use the middleman. The other one, we don't need to use the architect as the middleman anymore, but you've got to keep them in form. Okay, 425. Based on the architect's evaluations of the contractor's application for payment, the architect shall review and certify the amounts due. Same provision from the B101. Architects certifying payment applications. 426. Here's the first time you've seen it. The architect has the authority to reject work that does not conform with the contract documents. The wall was here. It should have been there. I can reject that. This contract... And my contract with the owner gives me authority to say that to you. I can reject that work. But it's one of the few times there's authority. They also have authority to regulate inspections or testing of the work. Um, but neither this authority of the architect nor a decision made in good faith to such authority shall give a rise or duty responsibility of the architect to the contractors or subcontractors. So, they have the authority, but this authority or no decision made in good faith um, to exercise such authority, to exercise or not exercise authority, shall give a rise or la duty or responsibility of the architect or the contractor. Meaning, if I have the authority of the architect to come in and in order an inspection, and that's my job as the architect, because my architect owner contractor requires me to do that. If I have the architect decide to do the inspection or don't decide to do the inspection, it doesn't put any liability one way or the other on the contractor. Contractor doesn't make the decision to run the inspection. That's the architect's responsibility. So if I'm walking the site and I choose not as the architect to order an inspection and then the test of an area, that doesn't mean the contractor should have stepped in and done the test of the inspection because it's not its duty. So that's what this back half of this is saying. Does that make sense? It's kind of... Yes, I have, yes, the architect has some authorities, but that doesn't mean the contractor has to make up when the architect fails to exercise its, its obligations. 427, same provision from the B101. You're going to review the submittals and shop drawings. Um, they will be in accordance with the submittal schedule. They're going to be reviewed for a reasonable promptness. Um, they're not conducted for the purposes of the, so this is the architect's work, is not done for the purposes of determining the accuracy and completeness of the details, aka doesn't have to check the math, such as dimension and quantities, or sub, sub, substantiating instructions for installation, so we're not doing the means and methods. Um, and then down here it also says the architect is not responsible for means and methods. So earlier on in this contract, in Article 3, it says contractor is responsible for means and methods, and now we're telling here that the architect is not. And we're telling here that the architect will review the shop drawings and other submittals, but doesn't have to check the math. You, contractor, need to know what the op op architect's obligations are. Exactly the same language from the B101. 428, 
Architect has to prepare change orders and construct the change directives. That's just the written documentation approving when they add the bathroom or the new driveway or whatever the change is on the project. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those next class. 429, the architect will conduct inspections to determine the date of substantial completion. Substantial completion, again, a defined term. We're going to cover that in Article 9, I think it's 9.8, but the term substantial completion means that the project is finished and fit for its intended use and purposes. Basically, if it's a toy factory, that you can get up and running and start making toys. Punchless work still needs to be done, but basically the project's finished. Um, so they can come in and they can do a final inspection to certify that there's substantial completion. That's what 429 says the architect is doing. And the architect is also going to be issuing the certificate for final payment. So the contractor knows the steps and sequences of what the architect's going to do on the project site. For 10, um, the architect will provide one or more project representatives. So the contractor knows who to talk to, who's the lead architect on the project. Again, same responsibility the architect owes the owner through the owner architect's contract. Uh, for 211, they will interpret and decide matters concerning performance and under requirements of the contract documents on written request, either the owner or the contractor. It's kind of like this independent decision maker or responding to RFIs. It's up to the architect if there's a question from the owner or the contractor to interpret that decision. And then it says 412, interpretation of decisions of the architect will be consistent with the intent of and reasonably inferable from the contract documents and will be in writing or in form of the drawings. So back, this, is, this provision here answers your question about how do they communicate how do we know that? Well, this provision here says they're going to be interpreting in decisions from questions from the contractor of what's in the, in, consistent with the intent of or inferred from the contract documents, in the, and the response will be in writing or in the form of documents. That's that response to the RFI. Um, this last part of the sentence is to say that the architect needs to wear the white hat. Will not show partiality to either, either meaning the owner or the contractor, and will not be liable for response or inter interpretation of decisions rendered in good faith. So when the architect is wearing that white hat independent decision maker cap on, it's supposed to be neutral and impartial. As I said, many times the complaint is the drawings aren't accurate and now I have to get a change order. So it's really hard for the architect to truly be independent because it's their drawings being challenged or criticized. But this provision is telling the contractor, and there's the same provision in the B101, that's what the architect should be doing. Should be wearing a white hat, not somebody else's colors. 4213, um, the decisions on aesthetic, so what it looks like, is fine, because it's their design. If the architect comes in and walks through and says, your paint job is terrible, they have ultimate decision making on that because it's aesthetic. Contractor's like, but it's painted, it's fine, it's fine. The architect's like, no, it's not fine. I have a project right now, I have a, a, a piece of litigation right now for a very high, 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 high end client. Um, their house is worth tens of millions of dollars, and the contractor did a very average job on the painting, among other stuff. And the architect didn't catch it. And the house is, there's so many problems with this house, there's tons and tons of things wrong with this house. Um, so we have potentially a claim against the architect for not having the proper final decisions for what the, what the house should look like. Um, there's also other structural problems and other things like that. But in this instance, it's telling the contractor, if the architect tells you the paint job is bad, that's fine. Um, and then 4214, they will review and respond to Request for information, RFI, that's where that is. Request for information about the contract documents. They will be made in writing at any time limits agreed upon or otherwise reasonable promptness. Seven to ten days you want to respond to with an RFI. And they will prepare and issue supplemental drawings and specifications if necessary. Again, same thing. As this is the process that they need to do in answer to your question from earlier. Okay, that's the architect. And we have um, about... 14 minutes to get through the subcontractors, and then we'll be done. And all the architect stuff, just for the exam, um, I'll go back and double check, but because basically Article 4 is uh, a, a 
mirror or regurgitation of all the duties and obligations of the architect in the B101, um, in Article 3 of the B101, I will not be testing you on duties and responsibilities of the architect in this exam because you've already been tested on that. There may be questions that says that talk about the contractor's understanding of the architect's duties and responsibilities or obligations because we know that's only authority. So we have to, there has to be an interface. But I'm not going to be saying uh, under the A201, does the architect have the responsibility of doing X? So I just want you to know I'm preparing the exam. So you have to understand how they, how they communicate, but not the, not the specific duties under Article 4 for that. Okay? All right. Uh, subcontractor. Subcontractor with a capital S. So anytime the word subcontractor is used in this document, it includes a person or entity who has a direct contract with a contractor to perform a portion of work on the site. So contractor enters into a subcontract with the electrical subcontractor. They are a subcontractor with a capital S. The entity that provides the conduit and the electrical wiring that that sub electrical subcontractor provides and buys is not defined as a separate as a subcontractor under here. That would be a sub subcontractor, and that's what's in five two twelve. Sub subcontractor is a person who has a direct or indirect contract with a subcontractor. So as it goes downstream, now this so it's tiers top tier contractor. Only the first tier below them is a subcontractor. That's it. Any of the tiers below that first level subcontractor, because it says direct or indirect under three five one two. Anybody in the tiers that you go down is going to be a sub-subcontractor. It's just for definitional of understanding when you're reading through the document of who's obligated for what. Okay? 5.2. Award of subcontracts and other contracts for portions of work. So this talks about, unless otherwise stated, the contractor has soon as practical after award of the contract, after they get the big contract, contractor wins the project to build the $10 million toy factory, shall notify the owner and the architect of persons or entities proposed with each principal portion of the work, including those who furnish materials and equipment and fabricated something. So when I get, when I'm the contractor and I win the toy factory contract, I have a limited period of time after I win the contract to tell the owner, I'm going to use Bob's plumbing and Sarah's electrical and Timmy's concrete. I'm going to tell the owner who my trades are going to be to give the owner the opportunity to review those. Now, many times that's going to be provided actually in the bid materials out of the beginning, but this says if you haven't provided it after you get the award, you have to provide it. Okay? And then the contractor, the owner is allowed to have a reasonable objection, the owner and the architect. Sometimes you find an architect that, that the contractor says, well, I've been working with this electrician for 20 years. And the architect's going to say, that may be fair and good, but the last three projects that I was involved on with them, their work has dramatically fallen off, and it's bad, and I don't want to use them. And that often happens. Architects will know which trades are good and not, and they'll tell the owner. And so you, you want to work with that. And so even though the contractor says who they are, um, there can be a reasonable objection to the person or the entity by the owner. And so that's what 521 says. 522, contractors shall not contract um, with somebody that the owner architect has made reasonable timely objection. If I don't like Bob con Bob's plumbing, and I'm the owner, and I tell the contractor that, the contractor has to find some reasonable substitution. So that's what 522 says. Now, um, the contractor should provide or propose another one. If the proposed is rejected, subcontractor was reasonably capable of performing the work, the contract sum and the contract time shall be increased or decreased by the difference. So what this means is, um, I say as the owner, I don't want to use Bob's plumbing. Find me somebody else. Contractor goes out, and Bob's plumbing, maybe I just don't like them. Maybe I know Bob and I don't like Bob. You know, they could reasonably do the work, whatever it is. Bob's plumbing was going to do the plumbing work for $150,000 in the contract. So the contractor's like, okay, we can't use Bob. We're going to go out. We're going to find um, Tom's plumbing. Tom comes in, and instead of being able to do the work for 150, Tom charges 175,000. If the contractor could show that there was 
that Bob was fine. Bob was reasonable. There was not a problem with the work. And the price has now gone up by $25,000. The owner has to pay for that. This says the contractor shouldn't eat that because the owners told me they don't want to use a reasonable subcontractor. What's reasonable and what, what you can get along with is questionable. And sometimes it's, you know, for plumbing, you should be able to find a pretty good plumber easily. But sometimes there's a specialty contractor that's only two or three in the industry and their price point is higher. So this can't have real effect on a project. It just, this is giving guidelines. If the contractor, if the owner rejects it and the contractor gets hit for more costs, the owner may have to pay for that. Um, However, no increase in the contract summer time shall be allowed for changes unless the contractor acted properly. So let's say that uh, we reject Bob's plumbing, and Bob could have done it, and they're reasonable, and then contractor lounges around and sits around and doesn't go out to find, and when they finally find Tom's plumbing, and the price has gone up, it's because the market has been flooded and the contractor was late in trying to secure that. If it's because of the delay of the contractor trying to get the replacement, then the contractor eats that cost. So that's schedule and otherwise. This provision, the bottom of this provision, comes out of litigation. So, because the contractor would have pointed to up above and said, hey, I, get to, I don't have to pay for any of this. And the owner says, well, no, the increase in cost was due to your delay. So that's litigation that put that in. 5.3, uh, subcontractor relationships. Each subcontractor needs to be bound to the terms of the contract documents. So I, contractor... And bound by everything under my contract documents. When I'm going to give those contract documents, the electrical work to the subcontractor, they need to be bound to it just like I was. It's so there's consistency in the terms. You know, if, if I as the contractor needs to turn something around to the owner in 10 days, I need to make sure that my subcontractor is under that same 10-day obligation so there's not a delay. And I as the owner want the contractor to do that as well. So they can't say... Well, they had more time, so that's why it took me more time. That's what 5.3 does. Um, continuing on, the contractor shall, in 5.3, the contractor shall make available to each proposed subcontractor prior to the execution agreement copies of the contract documents to which the subcontractor shall be bound. So you're going to say to the subcontractor, here are the plans and specs. Here is my contract with the owner with dollars and cents and some stuff redacted out. You, subcontractor, must follow these rules as well. So everybody is playing Monopoly by the same set of rules. That's what 5.3 is saying. Um, 5.4, contingent assignment of subcontractors. Each subcontractor is an agreement form. The work is assigned by the contractor to the owner. What this says is um, every contract that you, every subcontract that the, sub, the contractor enters into, so owners on top, contractors here, and they've got 10 subcontractors below. Each one of those subcontractors have a subcontract. If something happens to the contractor, they go bankrupt, they have problems with issues, whatever happens, and that they are somehow removed from the picture, you have 10 subcontractors that are out actually doing the work. The owner may want to keep some of those trades on the project. If the project, if the contractor's already entered into an agreement with Bob's Plumbing to do it for $150,000, and the owner has to renegotiate that agreement later on, the owner probably is going to have to pay more. So what they have here is what's called a contingent assignment, where the owner, if the contractor is removed from the middle, the picture, that subcontract is already assigned to the owner. The owner just picks up and takes the place of the contractor. It's a contingent. It's contingent on X, Y, and Z. In this case, the contractor being removed, the owner wanting to take Bob's plumbing. So that's what this says. The assignment of that is only effective upon termination of the contract, so the owner has to terminate the contractor. And then when the owner accepts the assignment of the, sub, sub, of the con, subcontract agreement, it assumes the contractor's rights. So whatever the contractor owed to the sub, the owner picks that up. So that's how a contingent assignment works. Let me see how many more I have here. Just one more. Um, upon such assignment, if the work has been suspended by more than 30 days, the subcontractor's compensation shall be equitably adjusted and increases in the cost resulting from that suspension. So sometimes what happens is, and let's go back, remember that 2.4, the nuclear option provision that I was talking about. 
Sometimes what will happen is the contractor's not doing its job, and there's some subs that are crappy, but there's some really good subs. And so what you say to the contractor, you're just going to say, I'm going to 2.4 you. I'm going to give you a Lotus of 2.4. I'm going to nuclear option you. And I want you to assign me the three trades that I like, and I don't want the four trades that you have. And you pick and choose. And then there's a fight back and forth between the owner and the contractor whether this should be happening or not. And the project gets suspended because under 2.4, you told the contractor to stop. When the owner and the contractor figure out their problem and the project starts up again, that subcontractor, Bob's Plumbing, has been sitting around for weeks while the owner and the contractor figure out their issues, or maybe months, maybe years. If there are costs, to Bob's plumbing for sitting around waiting. This provision, 5242, says Bob's plumbing gets an increase in adjustment in their contract for their delay. It's not Bob's plumbing's fault that there was a fight between the owner and the contractor. And Bob's plumbing is going to say, if you want me to keep working for you, I've incurred costs waiting around. You've got to pick that up. And that's fair. So, and then finally, 543, under the assignment of the owner, the section 54, the owner may further assign the subcontract to a successor contractor or other entity. So sometimes what happens is owners in a contractor with contract with contractor, they've got 10 subs. This contractor goes bankrupt or the owner fires this contractor. The owner doesn't want to be the contractor of the project. The owner just wants to be the owner and pay the bills. They'll bring in a, a substitute contractor. And so what happens is Bob Plumbing gets assigned to the owner the new contractor comes in and the owner assigns Bob's plumbing contract to the new owner, new contractor, and that's what this is. It's just a method by which you can place the contract with the right entity that's going to administer the contract. Okay? All right, we're going to stop there. And um, we will get through 6 through 15 next week. Uh, and this, um, I'll get this lecture up online this afternoon. I'll get it to you guys right away. So, okay? Thanks very much.